dance. And your host, Rhonda Jones. And featuring the man who unchurched them all, Dr. Michael W. Jones. Once again, we're here at the place, and we have uh, a special guest this morning, uh, and I, I think this is going to be an excellent show, but I, I wanted to say a few things before I introduce him. I want to say that, you know, it's, it's wonderful to come together, uh, simply to be able to see what others perceive to be true. That is, to be able to take off our glasses look through their lens, take off our shoes, put on their shoes, and walk in their shoes for a while just to see their perspective. And so this morning is not a debate. It's not a contest to see who is right or wrong. It's simply a show about listening to someone else who might differ. And so I think that if we can give humanity, that is human beings, across the board respect, I think that we can learn how to move forward together. And at the end of the day, I think that this will create an atmosphere, an environment, if you will, that will help us all. And so this morning, I'm not here to teach. I'm here to listen and even be taught, for I think that we can learn from each other. And so I, I don't want our guests this morning to feel uncomfortable. I want our guests to feel very, very welcomed. I want our guests to feel loved and accepted unconditionally. And so with that said, I would like to welcome Christopher Mounty first because he's my co-host this morning. Welcome, Christopher. Dr. Jones, so good to hear your voice. Well, thank you. And our heart has been with you. Uh, uh, you guys are so awesome to us. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, and, and I, I keep encouraging people to build relationships with atheists. I, I'm a theist, you're an atheist, but um, sometimes I just put down my theism. And I think that you put down your atheism simply so we can relate and get mm -hmm. close. And that's been so meaningful to all of us here. Absolutely. And, and uh, uh I'm reciprocating the exact sentiments. I mean, uh, being able to an, engage uh, in the NCG as a community um, has helped me not only intellectually, um, but I would even say uh, spiritually. And, um, you know, um, from an honest perspective, mentally and psychologically, you know what I mean? I've actually been able to lean on members of the New Covenant group lately and uh, in such a way that, you know, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I really do. I, I'm going to have to say that we also have leaned on you. I, I remember so many occasions in which certain things would happen, and it was your wisdom, it was your kindness, it was your patience, it was your genius, it was your style that helped us to take another, another step forward. And I'd like to thank you for that, not just from me, but my wife and I and everyone here at NCG Studio. And so... Uh, with Thank that you. said, let's go ahead and welcome our special guest. His name is G-Man. That's what he goes by on YouTube, and he's famous. And uh, he's famous in the sense that he keeps preaching, uh, I think, on the streets, if I'm not mistaken. And he has a ministry called Preaching to the Choir Ministries. And so I would like for you guys to welcome G-Man to our show. He's a wonderful individual. First of all, I'd like to say, uh, G-Man, I do like your hat. I can see you. You can't see me. And um, all of my children, they love hats. And so um, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. It's, it's an honor to be here today. And uh, I hope that I can be a, uh, a help and a blessing to those uh, who are here today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to jump into the Bible. I'm, I'm convinced that this 
this book sometimes is misunderstood, especially by me. Sometimes I, I, I don't have a clue as to what it means uh, or what these authors uh, are trying to convey. And so I, I ask for help. And I'm not asking for help just from one human being, but from all kinds of people who have a different perspective. And so this morning, what we're going to attempt to do is to establish the context of chapter 3 and deal with chapter 3. And so I'm going to put the ball in your park and say, where do you want to start with this chapter 3 of the book of John conversation? Because this deals with some uh, very popular verses like uh, the idea of being born again. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of John 3.16. And those are very popular uh, verses or passages, I should say. And so uh, I'm going to leave it up to you. Let's start where you want to start. Okay. And uh, forgive me if I sound a little nervous because I think this is my, one of my first times having a, a Bible study of this magnitude. Um, um, one of the reasons why I love uh, John chapter 3 so much is because um, in John chapter 3, we get we get um, Jesus telling us uh, uh, how to become a, um, one of his followers, how to become a Christian and, um, and, and all that it entails. Um, from the time that we see uh, Nicodemus in John chapter um, 3, verses 1 and 2, uh, coming to Jesus by night, uh, uh, you know, coming to him and asking um, him, uh, um, 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 or, or rather saying to him uh, that, that they know that 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 he that that he is from God. I mean, Nicodemus was a um was 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 part of the Sanhedrin. He was a member. Of, he, I think he was a Pharisee, and um, he came to Jesus by night and said that that, that I know, and rather we know that that what you're doing is from God. You know, and um, for him to say something like that in public, you know what I mean? He would have been ostracized, demonized. He would have been probably kicked out of the Sanhedrin because of it. You know what I mean? Then Jesus gets right to the point. He says that unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. Meaning what he's saying is that until you change your perspective about God, as a matter of fact, I got some stuff written down here. Until you change your perspective um, or, or have a new relation uh, or new understanding about God and more accepting about the things of God, put on a new nature, you're not going to be able to come into the kingdom because you, because you won't be able to accept the things that come by faith um, um, in the gospels. Now, already I have a couple of questions coming at this with naive eyes. So mm -hmm. do you mind if I just jump in with a couple questions so that, um, so that I can get a little clarity? Um, no so there's, there's a couple of things, right? There's the idea of being born again, and then there's the idea of, um, go, uh, what is the word? The kingdom of entering the kingdom of God, which, which right. I'm, you know, I, I'm just naively assuming they're talking about heaven, right? Right. They're, not use, they're not using the word heaven, but kingdom of God for all intents and purposes. And this text represents heaven, you know, the, the afterlife. Right. Um, so th let's just start with those two things. So being born again, what exactly does that mean in practical terms? Okay. Um, the best way I can try to explain it to you is, um, uh, and since I'm only using one chapter, uh, Dr. Jones, if you don't mind, I, I might have to reference um, – other chapters, but if you don't want me to do that, I'll just like... No, uh, no, no. I, what, what I'd like for you to do is to feel very comfortable here. And, and by the way, I want to know which uh, translation model are we going to be using? Because I, I want to, you know, stay on the same page with you. Uh, which translation are you going to be using? Okay. Uh, right now I'm using the King James. Uh, I have another translation, but... Um, which, which, it, King, which King James uh, Bible are you using? Oh, the, the authorized one, not the, uh, the new King James, the regular King James. No, one. you're using the, the, the version that came after many uh, different uh, revisions. Is that correct? Um, because I guess it, so. I guess well, so, yeah. I'm saying, you know, in 1611, it wasn't a version. It was simply a Bible, and it was people here in the West that called it a version, and it's been revised many times. And so I, I'm just wanting, you know, they don't all read the same, so I'm just wanting to compare apples to apples. And so we're, we're just using a, uh, a particular Western model of, of the version. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Just, okay. just the yeah. good old King James Version. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, to answer your question, uh, Chris Amati, um, regarding uh, uh, what it means to be born again, um, according to the scriptures, um, uh, because of what happened uh, during, during uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall, God declared us as being spiritually dead, 
um, that means that, 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 that we're separated from God. Okay. And because we're separated from God, it's very hard for people to accept the things from God. I mean, obviously if you look at people who just don't believe, they just don't believe some of the things that's in the Bible, you know? Um, but in order to be able to come into the kingdom and be his child and to walk and to walk with him by faith, your old nature has to go and you have to become a new person. And that can't happen unless it happens spiritually. Um, in John chapter three, verses three and seven, it reads, um, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. Now I want to stop at verse four there because, because when Jesus said that he had to be born again, he was talking about something spiritual, but Nicodemus response was a natural response because when he heard this, wow, you're talking about me going back into my mother's womb and being born again. You know what I mean? That way. It almost seemed like he's, it almost said, it almost seems like he's saying it in a mocking term. Like, Oh, like what? I can go back into my mother's womb and be born again. You know, it almost seems like he's mocking what Jesus is saying. Exactly, exactly. Only only setting Jesus up to clarify and kind of lay down the law, which is kind of where I want you to go next. Okay, and that now, would be verse 5. C- can I ask a question at this point? Yes, no problem. Okay. Now, you started out with the first couple of verses, and you've established the point that we have Nicodemus. He's namely one of the rulers of, of the Jews, I think, that right. you're admitting to. Yes. And so he comes to him at night. By the time that we get down to verse 3, Jesus is saying, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. In other words, he's giving the prerequisite for something, correct? Yes. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And a few minutes ago when Christopher was asking you what the kingdom of God was in this context, uh, you stated heaven. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I've got I, a I think Chris said that, I think. Oh, okay. But is, is that what you're saying this particular verse means in verse 3? The kingdom of God is heaven? Um. No, not really, because the kingdom of God um, is, uh, I don't know how to explain this. Um, okay, the church is an organism here on the earth, like, right. like, like there are members of the body of Christ all over the world, right. which we call the church. And, and as a organism, we're in a kingdom that is ruled by God. Um, um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily heaven, but it's um, God's rulership over his people. See, Would I, you I, consider I, it I, being I, in the graces of God? Like see, being in, in God's kingdom is being in the graces of God? Yeah, I, yes. yes okay. I can accept that. Yes, the, I can the, accept the, that. the reason that I ask about the issue of heaven, because I, I think that most people interpret this to be heaven, and I'm so glad to hear that you're saying that it's not heaven. For if we read verse 12, King James Version of chapter 3, he said, and this is Jesus speaking, if I have told you earthly things, and he was speaking about earthly things up until verse 12, mm-hmm. and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things, which indicates that he's not talking about heavenly things up until this point in the conversation, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say that. I would say that. And um, so, chapter, I mean, verse 12 dismisses the whole idea of heavenly speech, it's just talking about something that's earthly, correct? No, uh, well, by the time you get to verse 12, he's, he's, he's um, um, telling him that, okay, like I said before when I was talking about a person being spiritually dead and, and in order for them to receive anything from, from God, they have to become a new person. Um, if that person doesn't, if, if that person isn't, is, isn't made alive spiritually and someone tries to explain something to to the earthly person about spiritual things, they're not going to be able to receive it. You know what I mean? Because if actually he's kind of being, he's actually being kind of critical to him. He's saying, well, you can't understand earthly things. And how can you understand anything that I say about spiritually things? You know what I mean? Okay. So, But it, just for the sake of clarity, I want to go back to verse three, because I want to understand what kingdom of God is. That is from your point of view. And I also want to look at that l- little term S E E C. Uh, are we talking about physically seeing something, or is this a term that should be taken metaphorically, that is, understanding something? Both, I would say, because um, uh, a lot of times uh, in Christianity, um, we, 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 um, we see things with our physical eyes, but, we, but then we have spiritual sight, too. Um, give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, 
If we see, let's say, for example, a, 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 a Christian doing something and they're doing acts of kindness, we can see that with our physical eyes. But without spiritual eyes, we can see um, Jesus working through that person to try to get a, um, a, a greater purpose um, uh, put forth. Right. You know, I, yeah. I, I was really impressed with uh, some of your earlier points because I, I think that you're of the mindset that people are struggling to understand X, Y, and Z, that is about God. And it, it, and it looks or appears to be the same thing in, let's say, the book of John, King James Version. That is, let's just call this guy King James John. Because in verse, I mean, chapter 1, verse 4, it says, the light shineth in darkness. And, and I would think that you would say that the light would be Jesus. I'm sorry, say that again? I'm simply saying when it says the light shineth in the darkness, that would be Jesus shining in darkness, not a literal darkness, but a metaphorical darkness. He's talking about people, and the darkness yes. comprehended yes. not. So he's talking about people. So darkness is a metaphor for people. So is, is the writer John talking about a comprehension problem? Is that what he's setting the premise for? And, you know, a difficult time understanding the light. We can do that, but we can actually stay in John chapter John. Maybe it is, you know, parenthetic, but I don't think so. I think so. I don't think of, I don't, I don't know of anyone who thinks this is parenthetically Jesus. And he comes to darkness, that is to people, but darkness really doesn't comprehend light. I agree with this in John chapter 2, verse 19. And, and I also think that you believe that Jesus is God, correct? Exactly. Okay, our text is that. Jesus makes the claim that he's going to raise this temple up, whatever this temple is, analysis of John, that is about darkness not being able to comprehend Jesus, that is God, in this context. For he set out, uh, reared up in three days. So they were in question about a physiological temple made out of stone. And so once again, we have a comprehension problem. So even those who were walking close to him, when we look at um, chapter 3, it's because when Nicodemus says, no one can do these miracles, thou doest, except God be with him. Now that sounds like a huge compliment, and it seems like that the typ typical person would say thanks, but that's not what Jesus says. He says something that's really strange, off the wall. He doesn't say thank you. In fact, he takes Nicodemus in a completely different direction. And it's possibly true that Nicodemus isn't understanding anything that Jesus is saying. Let me give an example. His response to the compliment was not thank you, but verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And once again, understanding comes into focus here. Verse 4, right. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? And so Nicodemus is understanding him in a phys physiological uh, sense or in a literal sense, and Jesus is speaking metaphorically, correct? Mm -hmm. And so we see a, a major comprehension problem. I could read all of the verses from chapter 1 through uh, chapter 2 and into chapter 3, and we find comprehension problem after comprehension problem, comprehension problem after comprehension problem. And so once again, my question is, is Jesus saying to Nicodemus, um, except a man be born again, in other words, unless you have this prerequisite met in your life, you cannot understand. Who are what I would call spiritually blind. They, 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 they don't understand the things about God. Um, and, and, and Jesus is telling them, look, you know, if, if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you, want to, if you want to understand the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Well, you know, you, you know, I, I hear a lot of theists say, you know, unless you're born again, you really can't have a Bible study. And, and there is a theological uh, mindset here that is from various kinds of theists who would argue that without the Spirit of God, everything is, you know, just, you know, foolishness unto you. And I think you would agree with that statement. I can't say that uh, fully. And the reason why I can't say that fully, um, especially from recent interactions with um with people who believe differently from me um i think 
um, people who are not born again will get a surface understanding of what the Bible says. Um, before I became a Christian, I had to understand some of the things that were said to me in order for me to be convicted, to be able to to be able to come to the truth. So I disagree with those that say now that I think now where, where they say that people who don't have the Holy Spirit can't um, can't understand the scriptures. But 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 I stand by what I've said before, where I don't think that people who are not born again can get the deep understanding of what um, God is trying to say unless they open themselves up to it. Yeah. Meaning they, they, they have to be willing to admit or at least think for a little while, you know, okay, God exists, you know, um, 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 that, 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 that he can do all the things that he's saying. When we begin to think like that, it's easier to be able to hear what people are saying. Oh, I'm sorry, not what people are saying, what the Bible is saying to you, um, what the message is, and, and to be able to try to comprehend it. Right. You so. know, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make, and I, I certainly don't agree with uh, much of this theology, but I, I'm trying to look through your eyes because I've heard so many people, especially in the reform circles, who would make the argument that this is very compatible with what the Apostle Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, which the implication is, you know, without the spirit, you know, you just can't get there. That is in your understanding. And so, once again, is the prerequisite that's being offered here, that is by Jesus, except a man be born again, whatever born again means, is that prerequisite something that is, is there to say, oh, this is your ticket to heaven? Or is this prerequisite here to say, oh, you have to have this before you can understand? Both. I would say that, that, that if you're not born again, then you can't go to... Then, here's the thing. If, if you remain spiritually dead or separated from God, then you're not going to want to spend an eternity with somebody you really don't know, someone that you don't understand, someone that you don't you know, worship. You know what I mean? Um, in order to be able to understand him and some of the things that we see going on in the scriptures, you do have to be, your, your, your mind has to be changed about a lot of things um, um, in relation to God and, you know, um, 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 and, and just accepting him. Because when you do become a Christian, when you do become a born again Christian, you do have to, um, you, you, can I put this? When you become a born again Christian, you're going to live a life of faith. You're not going to be able to see a lot of things with your physical eyes, but you're going to have to be able to see the things with both your physical eyes and your spiritual eyes. And you have to be able to accept that those things are from God, you know, based on things that we read in the scripture and the facts that we see behind those things. Um, as far as our understanding, um, you can have limited understanding without being born again. And there's proof of that all over the place. There are people who are not Christians that understand um, a, a lot of the things that's in the Bible, but when it comes to the deeper things of God, they 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 just can't understand them. And, and this is just I, my I, 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 about I, I, it. okay. Go ahead, Christopher. Well, what I was going to say is, <clears throat> it seems like we're nuancing uh, a point, and I just want to make sure that I'm on the same page with you all. Um, so there seems to be like a couple different levels here. One of which is, um, if I can paraphrase what you guys have been saying, it sounds like. Um, one of the things being nuanced is when you are born again, when you are um, under the graces of God, uh, when you are a believer, the interpretation through which you read the Bible changes. It's the same words strung together. They're the same sentences. But uh, I think that G-Man, his analogy is awesome. Um, it's that you're not looking at it with your spiritual eyes open. Right. And then once you do become born again or, or a believer, um, and that's kind of what we're hashing out right now. Right. What yeah, is being yeah. born again? Um, but once you do open your spiritual eyes, it looks completely different than before for, for, than reading the Bible before you had your spiritual eyes open or looking at acts of kindness. <clears throat> from a Christian with your physical eyes just looks like one person doing X action. But through your spiritual eyes, you see Jesus Christ working through that person in, in, in that sense. So I think there's, there's that level. And then um, I'm kind of picking up something else about what Dr. Jones is bringing into the, into the mix. Um, and, and, and I guess instead of trying to paraphrase it, maybe I'll just ask you, Dr. Jones, because you brought up a lot of, oh, it kind of revolves around the fact that when Jesus is talking in John 3, um, he seems to be talking to people that his message isn't connecting with, 
And Jesus has to go into detail more and more about what he means, right? So like the point that you made about Nicodemus um, gives Jesus a compliment. And instead of Jesus saying, thank you, he's like, yeah, but here's the deal. And he goes into even more detail uh, with, with the kind of understanding that, yeah, you kind of don't know what you're getting into. So let me explain it to you. Am I on the same page with what you guys are saying right now? I, I think that you are, and I think that you're helping to, you know, broaden the scope of this conversation. And I, I guess I'm asking for clarification because I, I, I agree with the G-Man. I, I think that people know regardless of whether they're born again or not. But I think that what G-Man is saying, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. I want him to make himself clear because I think he's more than capable of doing so. I think what he's saying that in particular that Jesus is saying when it comes to knowing about the kingdom of heaven, that's not possible without this prerequisite met. I think what G-Man is saying is you have to have this prerequisite. That is, you have to be born again before you can understand the kingdom. And so it's, it's really a superfluous argument to say, oh, I can see what you see if I'm not born again. But I may be reading something into what G Man is saying, but I uh, no, no but actually I, you're you're pretty on point. You're 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 pretty on point with that um, because um, th- I mean let's face it, there's a lot of things and in, in, in that we're taught in this Bible that's very hard to um under well not hard to understand but 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 hard to um hard to believe. You know, talking donkeys. You know, global floods. You know, God. You know, um, a lot of things that we see in the Old Testament, a lot of things that we see in the New Testament with people being rose from the dead and everything. Um, but unless we see things from God's perspective, it's very hard to be able to understand how those things could be possible, especially when we're comparing it with uh, with, with scientific evidence and, uh, and 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 the things that um, we see in the natural world. Because, you know, walking on water, I don't think that's uh, scientifically possible in any way for a person just to, you know, to walk on water, no matter how you look at it. But if you look, if, if you begin to understand who the not even not even understanding, accepting who the person of Jesus is and accept um, what, what the message is in the New Testament and what the Bible was saying about God and everything, then it's not hard to understand it no more. But in order to, for that to happen, the old man has to be put off. You, 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 you have to stop being this. Um, you have to stop being disconnected to God, rather. And you have to become you have to be connected to him by being born again. You have to be able to um, um, um to take those necessary steps to be able to see things the way God does. So, in other words, if I'm not misunderstanding you, and please correct me if I am, I think what you're saying, and, and you were speaking about eyes, spiritual eyes, and, and not, I think you're simply saying that, you know, acad- academic eyes can't see this, but spiritual eyes can. With a lot of things, yes. Yeah. And so, <laughs> a lot of things. But what, what you're trying to say, it's, it's, it's like relationships, you know, Academic eyes may not be able to understand how a relationship works, and therefore a different set of glasses might be necessary. And so is Jesus, is he talking about giving us a better pair of glasses so we can see, you know, the kingdom of God, and other people are just blind, as you were talking about a while ago? Or I are think that's a good analogy. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I, I really want to see what you see because it really helps me. And And by the way, I think that, most of the people here in the New Covenant group are not interested in fussing. You know, there's a big difference between fussing and good argument and good conversation. I think we're mm-hmm. having a wonderful conversation, wonderful time here. And I mm-hmm. thank you so much for coming our way. And, it's, and it's, it's refreshing simply to say, I want to know exactly what you mean. And you may not have any academic basis for saying something because your perception may be, I am looking at this through spiritual eyes rather than academic eyes. If I, if I can jump in real quick, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, G-Man and I had a conversation with somebody um, while he was on a, um, while he was helping me co-host uh, my Monday night meeting of the mind show um, uh, when it first got started. And this kind of sounds very similar to like an analogy we had where <clears throat> we were talking about evidence. Now, I'm not going to get in a conversation about evidence. I'm just going to use that conversation as an analogy. And we were talking about quantitative versus qualitative evidence, right? And it almost seems like you guys are talking about the same kind of things in the sense that when you put your academic eyes on, you're looking for quantitative evidence, science, you know, the scientific method, this, that, and the other. But with your spiritual eyes, you're seeing 
quality. You're seeing qualitative differences that I think um, that, and when people talk about evidences, um, I kind of think it's interesting because just like you're talking about when people read the Bible with academic eyes, they might be seeing a veneer of understanding, but that underneath that veneer is a lot of qualitative information that can only be seen with your spiritual eyes. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Yeah. I can't disagree with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Excellent you know. point, uh, Christopher. That was good. Uh, let, let's move on. So uh, if, if I'm not misunderstanding you, uh, the idea of seeing the kingdom of God, whatever the kingdom of God is in this context, uh, let's just leave that loose for the sake of argument. Whatever this is, unless you're born again, you really can't see, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, let's take it a step further. If, if we have to have this prerequisite, uh, how can we have this prerequisite met that is in our lives? Or do we need to meet it? In other words, has it already been done? You know, what is it? What does it mean to be technically, quote unquote, and I shouldn't say technically, or, you know, looking through the spiritual eyes of it? What is Jesus talking about here when it comes to being, you know, or having this prerequisite, whatever born again means? What does it have? What is that prerequisite being met? If I, if I understand what you're saying, um, if, if, if you're talking about like how to become born again or, or how to, how to um to be able to see things from from well, the eyes of God? It, it, it's kind of like if I deal with some Reformed theologians, they will say that you know the issue of being born again. Let me turn to a passage that you will be familiar with, and that would be Ephesians. Okay, the Book of Ephesians. Uh, it's just a few pages over. If you have a Bible like mine, uh, and my Bible is uh, quite torn, so it's rather clumsy to get there. But in Ephesians, uh, the it's writer... Good to have a torn-up Bible. <laughs> yeah, a torn-up Bible, yeah. Uh, but I, I go through these things, uh, you know, just all the time. I'm thankful for computers. And so uh, <laughs> may, maybe you can help me to understand this particular passage uh, because it says in chapter 2, verse 4 of this book that we call this universal epistle. That is, most theologians refer to it that way or this way. It says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ or with Christ. And so it says in parentheses, by grace ye are saved. And so a lot of uh, Reformed theologians would suggest that at the same time that Jesus was quickened, or made alive, we were made alive. Let me read this from the NIV. The NIV in verse 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And so the timing of salvation, according to theologians, that is, of some Reformed uh, minds, are actually saying that the salvation, this born-again experience or this quickened mindset actually took place 2,000 years ago. When Christ was, you know, quickened or made alive, we also were made alive with him. And so that's where I'm going next is uh, when it comes to being born again, uh, does this verse, does this chapter tie into this concept of being born again? If not, what does it mean to be, uh, what does it mean by being made alive with Christ? In other words, at the same time Christ was made alive, we were made alive. What does that mean? Okay, um, I'm not sure if I agree that um, that verses, uh, the, the, the verses that you read um, uh, uh, means that Jesus was, um, that, that, that Jesus was uh, quickened. I think they're talking about us. Uh, uh, that we were quickened with the Holy Spirit, if I'm not mistaken. Well, in um, the King James Version, it says, hath quickened us together with Christ. Yeah. Um, and he, and say, he's dealing specifically with his death because the next verse says, and he says, by grace you have, are saved. In other words, he's claiming that salvation is something that, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from the standpoint of an English translation 
and through the eyes of Reformed theologians. I'm not speaking for myself, but they claim that, and hath raised us up together. In other words, they're placing this in the past to suggest not only were we made alive with him, quickened together with Christ, but we've also been raised up together with Christ and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so the claims of some Reformed theologians is that all of this stuff took place 2,000 years ago. It was made possible 2,000 years ago. Um, so this can, this can happen right now for someone if they would just come to um, Jesus Christ by believing, you know, the, the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, but, but what was accomplished 2,000 years ago is Jesus made the way for people to be able to, um, to, be able to come to him by faith through grace. But, um, but, uh, but, so but, you're, you're but, saying technically no one was quickened together with Christ. This is something that has subsequent action, action after the fact, and this is something that happens when you do something, correct? It, it's not a matter of being quickened actually with Christ. You really were not raised with Christ, and all of these things really didn't happen. This is just a hypothetical thing that can happen if you make a choice. No, it's not hypothetical. Um, it's okay. Jesus Christ made the way when he when when he died for the sins of humanity. Um, but but we can become joined together with Christ if we come to Him by faith by believing on Him, um, which actually goes in back to John chapter three, actually, where Jesus um, from three from um, from verse fifteen to verse um, I would say eighteen. Well, you can go further than that, but. If you don't mind, I'd like to read it if you don't mind. Certainly. Let me turn back to John chapter 3 because I want to be on the same page with you. And I okay. do appreciate your honesty here. You're, you're simply saying that you, you disagree with some people that is in the Protestant movement who model this differently. And I like that, that you have the, uh, you know, the honesty to say, I don't agree with that. Uh, that that's wonderful. So let's go where you think it is true. And so I'm in John chapter 3. Are you there, Christopher? You bet. Are you having fun? It, this is great. Uh, yeah. 316, is that where we're starting? I think we're no, going 315. to 315. 315. Okay. Yeah. Now there are, there's a lot in between uh, the verse that we left off with in, in verse 3, uh, 4 through 15. There's a lot that needs to be talked about before 15, right. but let's start with verse 15 just for the sake of, of making things go. But the reason why I just want to let you guys know the reason why I want to read this is I want to talk about what has to be done in order to have that quickening with Jesus Christ. OK. Um, beginning. Yeah. So um, John chapter three, verse 15 reads that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. In the final verse, verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And the way we, we come to Christ and have that quickening with him is by believing. Okay. By, by, by once again, um, um, you, you have to be born again in order to be able to understand the deeper things about God. But in order to, to, to have that relationship with Jesus Christ, like it's talking about um, in Ephesians with, with, with the chapter and verse that you were speaking about, you have to believe. OK. And if you don't believe, you know, uh, the gospel, if you don't if you don't believe his teachings, it's very difficult for 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 God to show you anything, because no matter what he shows you, you're just going to constantly be like, well, you know, that can't be true because of this, and that can't be true because of that. You know what I mean? But in order to be really connected to him, you have to believe, you have to, you have to hear him, you have to be able to trust him, you have to be able to, to really test some things. And um, in order to have that connection, you just have to believe um, um, in order to be to, to be quickened with Christ. It, it's, it's not something that 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 I would say. Okay, Jesus died on the cross, and all of a sudden everybody was quickened. No, you 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 have to be able to believe on Jesus for that to happen to you personally. So, I would say. In, in other words, you're saying the death of Christ is one thing, but in order for those blessings, if you will, uh, to become a reality, it's pending. That is your belief in Him, correct? Exactly, exactly. Okay, exactly. so if I can ask a couple of questions, I'd like some definition here. 
a number one of condemnation because verse 19 in the King James Version states, and this is condemnation. Now, let's read what condemnation is. Let's see if it's hellfire, brimstone, or whatever. It says, and this is condemnation, that light, that would be Jesus, has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Would you agree with, with that? So condemnation is not go to hell, uh, blah, 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 but it's rather uh, more or less, you know, light uh, came into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Is that correct? Um, condemnation um, I'm saying, applies it. I'm saying you know, as defined by this verse. Yeah, as defined by this verse, because it, this word shows up a couple of times, I believe uh, three times, I think, between the verses that, that, that I got finished reading. Yeah, but um, is Jesus defining con condemnation for Nicodemus in this context? Um, he's not defining condemnation. Rather, rather he's, 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 he's expressing why the condemnation is coming. Uh, in verse 19, it says, and this is the condemnation. That, rather, this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Um, if he were to define condemnation, then he would say that, okay, um, you know, when I come back, you know, and, and, and I judge humanity, um, 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 condemnation would be me finding you guilty for re for 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 remaining for for intentionally remaining in your state of being spiritually dead. Okay. Now you're saying that we come to Jesus when we make some form of decision, correct? As opposed to the model that says that 2000 years ago when he died, we died, and when he was made alive, we were made alive, when he was raised, we were raised. You're not for that kind of theology. You're for the kind of theology that says he did this and there is something pending. You need to go to Christ and believe, correct? Exactly. Okay. Because if you don't go to Christ, then you're then <laughs> you're not born again. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at verse you know? twenty in this same context. For mm -hmm. everyone that doeth evil. Now I I have to admit, in the context of the Bible, when it defines evil, when it says for everyone that doeth evil, I do evil. I I, I don't have any. Uh, I don't want to be dishonest about that. I do evil. But let's listen to what it says. For everyone that d doeth evil hateth the light. And in this context, the light is whom? Jesus Christ. Okay. So it says, everyone who doeth evil hateth the light, namely Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And so is, is Jesus saying that people will come to Jesus? Or is he saying that people will not come to Jesus slash light because they do evil things? I think what it's saying is that um, if we can change that word evil just for the sake of like the people that's listening here to mm -hmm. sin, okay, that people that like to sin, um, a lot of them don't want to go to Jesus because of the feeling of guilt and, and, and feeling like, well, you know, I did a naughty thing or a bad thing. So, so they avoid the light. But those people that are in the light, and they're doing the same things. They go to the light. Okay. As a matter of fact, let me read it here. Um, we were reading verse um, verse 19, right? Or was it 20? Mm -hmm. 20. Verse 20. Verse 20. Okay. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So, I agree with you, um, Dr. Jones. I do evil, too. I do a lot of things I have no business doing as a believer. But when I get on my knees or however I choose to go to God in prayer and I go to him and, and, and I present my deeds to him, this verse is made true when it says that, that, that those deeds were made manifest, that they were wrought in God, meaning God was the one drawing me to him to talk about those sins so I can humble myself and turn from those things. I so, hope that helps. So in a sense, you're saying... You can do evil, and it's true that I won't go to Christ, but yet at the same time, if I uh, do truth, I can come to Christ. Is that correct? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Now, but, but, uh, another but, word that I wanted to focus on. Oh, go ahead and make your statement. I didn't mean to interrupt. I apologize. Okay. Um, I just want to say that, um, that, that if someone does evil, they have the opportunity to come to Christ. You know, like I said, I do evil, and I do it often. Or, or just for the sake of everyone who's listening, because some people don't like that word, uh, use sin or, or, or naughty things. You know what I mean? Or things right. that are against God. Okay? I do those things myself. 
Now, okay. w w when it comes to people coming to Christ, let's just read something for the sake of argument. Chapter 6 is very much in concert with chapter 3. Okay. Uh, uh, and I, I think that you would uh, agree with this. Uh, verse 35, And Jesus saith unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay. And then verse 36 says, But I said unto you that, you that ye also have seen me and believed not. Right. And verse 37 makes this statement that some Reformed theologians really say that this is powerful. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. Now, the question is, when it says all that the Father gives to the Son, would this be those people who the Father gives to the Son, that is to die for their sins? This is a tricky passage of Scripture. It's not um, tricky. It's, it's just, it's, it's simple. But... but but there's a reason why I'm saying it's tricky. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Because it goes into certain, uh, a, a certain teaching that I'm like, kind of like with that predestination type, um, type teaching. Um, but I will say this. Um, it, 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 it does say that God is the one drawing the people to Jesus. Okay. Um, um, but, but my which, question is. Which, which, which suggests that there are some that he's not drawing to himself. You, you understand what I'm saying? Right. But there are other passages, passages in Scripture that would suggest that God is drawing everyone to himself. It's just that some people, you know, are hearing the message and they just don't want to, they just don't want to come. But, they just don't want to believe. But, it, but you know? how, how can we reconcile verse 37 in your point of view, all that the Father giveth me? That is, you know, if, if the Father, and let's just say for the sake of argument, quick argument, that this is the Father giving to the Son those he dies for. If the Father gives uh, to the Son every human being that's ever lived, ever will live, if that's true, it says, shall come to me. How do we approach this verse? Do we say this is true or do we just say it's not true? We say it's true because if you look at other passages in the scripture, um, it says, it, it teaches that God desires for no man to perish, but he wants everyone to come into the um, to come to the knowledge of truth, yep. but God doesn't want to force anyone to come to the knowledge right. of truth. He'll 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 send pastors, evangelists, prophets, or whoever out there to be able to preach um, or 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 show the good news to other people, yep. so that they come into the kingdom of God, so that I, they can become part of uh, you know, um, I, you know I, did, the, I did the, the body of Christ. I, I didn't mean to ask that question. You know, is it true or not true? I should have said. Should we look at this thing as true or not true, or possibly am I misunderstanding it? Maybe it needs to be explained differently, and so I apologize for that. So let, let's continue to move in this text a little bit because I want to ask another question about you know those passages that you were reading in in the book of John, verse okay. forty four of this same chapter says, "No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day." Uh, does right. this imply that uh, you can't come to God unless he's drawn you? It sounds like you can't get there on your own. Just give me one second. You said John chapter 3, verse 44, or you said John, 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 John chapter, chapter 6, verse 44. Okay, just let me look real quick. Um, got a little lost there. <laughs> That's okay. While you're looking, I'd like to interject a little something. I'm, I'm really appreciating how nuanced this is becoming because it seems like what we're wrestling right here with is the idea that um, there is a message that Jesus is admitting people are resistant to, um, but at the same time, he wants as many people to um, be included in the kingdom of God as possible. So, because it, it almost seems like there's a, I don't, I don't want to say contradiction, but there seems to be a little rub there where it's like, I am the light into darkness. Darkness does not want light. But at the same time, I would like, and you know, everybody uh, to be brought into the kingdom of as many people being brought into the kingdom of heaven as possible. Does that sound like you know? It seems like there's a rub there, and, I, and that I, seems to be what we're teasing out here. See, I think that you're really going in the right direction there because it sounds like you know the light comes to the world. There's none of darkness understands any of light, and I think G-Man would agree with that. Correct? 
Or am Sorry, I say that again? Because I was. That's <laughs> it. Uh, you know, we started you know talking about John one, and I think it's verse three or four, where it says light you know comes into darkness, and you know darkness doesn't understand it. So the question mm-hmm. would be, how much of darkness understood any of light, and light being Jesus? According to Jesus, the, the, the darkness have not understood the light, I so, guess, in its entirety, I suppose. Okay. Um, so I, I, this is the dilemma that, that I'm in here, uh, that is, according to Protestant theology. If mm-hmm. none of darkness understands any of light, why would darkness even approach light? Because God draws darkness to the light. Okay. Um, but, but just real quick, I want to go back to answer something that you said before. Um, Certainly. Uh, about what we were reading in John chapter 6, verse 44, which before I completely forget what I was going to say, um, it says that no man, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, uh, draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Uh, if you go to Romans, um, Romans chapter 3. Okay. Um, okay, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Right. It says, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, which which suggests and actually confirm um, what we're seeing, I believe, in John chapter 44, where it says that no one comes to him unless God draws him. Because a practical example of what I'm talking about is, and I even ask Christians, this, and a lot of them are ashamed when I ask them this. I go, um, well, how many of you, when you woke up in the morning, thought about God and, 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 and wanted to do what he wanted you to do when you woke up in the morning? And a lot of us, myself included, got to say, wow, <laughs> I never even thought about it that way. You know what I mean? Um, when I'm out evangelizing, I ask the same question. Okay. And then I try to tie that and say, and tie it, tie it in, and say, "Listen, the only the, the only way a person can come to God if God draws them to God, you know, what I mean, draws them to Himself rather. I'm sorry, so that they can hear the message and have an opportunity to believe that message. Now, not everyone's going to believe it. I understand that, but God is giving them the opportunity to believe the message, so that they can come out of the darkness and into the light. But th- I've got a curiosity question, you know, just and. In- I have a Bible that's torn here, so I can't read it out of the King James Version. I have a parallel in front of me, and so I apologize for not being able to read it from the King James Version. But I'm going to read this from the NIV, and that would be in the same chapter that you're quoting from. Okay. It says, what if some did not have faith? And I think the King James Version uses the term believe there. It says, will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? And if I continue to read, it says, not at all. It says, let God be true and every man a liar. Could it be true that maybe Paul was talking about, you know, some people think that, you know, if you don't have faith, you know, just damn you. Uh, Could it be true that maybe the Apostle Paul was saying, your lack of faith has nothing at all to do with the faithfulness that is of God because God's going to continue to be faithful to you. Or is that not true? I would agree with that. Um, you're talking about a Romans chapter 3? Romans or? chapter 3, verse 3, yes. Okay, just give me, give me one second just so I can confirm what you're saying. Okay, it says, For what if some did not believe and show their unbelief make, make the faith of, of God without effect? Oh, okay, all right, oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Um, yes, I would agree because um, um, if we come to Christ, um, I'm sorry, let me see this here. That's interesting. Um, just give me one second. I like to think on it a little bit before I say anything because okay. I was going to say something and then I was going to contradict myself. Well, and so there you go. I think that's a that's awesome. The fact that you were just as honest as you were right now <laughs> is the point of what we're doing. Yeah. You know, we we want to get to know what you're thinking. And hey, if we brought a question to mind that maybe you hadn't thought about, chew on it for a hot second. I mean, it's you know, yeah, we're, you know, we're all exploring this together. Exactly. You know, one of the things that I don't want to do, I don't want to push you. I don't want to trap you. I don't want to try to say something that you're not saying. We're having a conversation. Part of having a conversation is being willing to say, oh, hold on a minute. Let me look at this. Let me uh, think about this. Maybe I read it a long time ago and it meant this to me and maybe I can remember that. And sometimes we just don't. Sometimes I get up in the morning and it's hard for me to remember my name. 
And so that's just part of it. And so we're having fun here this morning. Hopefully, uh, you will get a hold of a friend and invite them to the conversation. We're going to take it a little bit longer. We're almost out of time. We have so many messages coming in. Uh, in fact, I'd like to bring you on next week if that were possible. G-Man, you've been a wonderful guest this morning. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very good conversation, um, very good Bible study, too. Um, as far as getting an answer out of me for Romans 3, uh, uh, three. I think that's what we're looking at. Romans yeah. three, three. I need. Mm-hmm. I think I'm gonna need some time to get back to you on that sounds, one because sounds, sounds good. I don't want to contradict myself, and I want to make sure my answer. Okay. Is, is sound. Now, now let, let's take it a little bit further. Since you went to the book of Romans, uh, just for the yeah. sake of just reading, you know, parts of Romans. For instance, mm-hmm. if we read out of a Protestant model, and I must insist on this, uh, chapter five, verse one, it says, "Therefore, being justified by faith." We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, since my Bible is torn, now get something close to this so you, people can see this. I can't re- This is my King James part of it, and it's just shredded. You know, it's worn. But I, I, I want to read the NIV that is in verse 9. And I want, to get a, I want people to get a sense of, of, of what G-Men might be saying here. Because in verse 9 it says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And I think that uh, you would advocate the doctrine of justification. Is that correct? Yes. Because I think that what you're saying in a sense, and I may be wrong, I think that you're saying that born again happens maybe at the same time as being justified. Exactly. Okay. Hmm. So exactly. what you're saying is when Jesus was speaking about being born again, and I'm trying to look through your glasses, walk in your shoes, I think mm-hmm. you're trying to say that your legal declaration before God is on the basis of having faith in him. Correct? Exactly. Okay. And verse mm-hmm. 9, it reads, since we have now been justified, that is, by his blood, that it's because he shed his blood for our sins. Mm-hmm. How much mm-hmm. more shall we be saved from the uh, wrath uh, through him? And I, I think you would say that, you know, he was trying to encourage the people to say, hey, you don't have to worry about the uh, future pouring out of the wrath of God, and so you're safe, correct? Exactly. Okay. Now, if I might take this a little bit further and turn a few pages, if you have a Bible like mine, and some of your Bibles may have all of this on the same page, but mine doesn't. So let's talk about, you know, this thing that may happen at the same time that born again happens, whatever these terms mean. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And I'm going to read this from the King James Version. For whom he did for no, he did predestinate. Now you brought up the term predestinate a while ago, and I said, Wow, he may go there. I said, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now listen to this. He's talking about those he foreknew. Verse 30, he says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And so in the context, if he foreknew you, he predestined you, correct? Correct. And then he says, if he's predestined you, he's called you, correct? And in the same context, he says, those whom he called, he also justified. And in the same context, those he justified, he also glorified. So if God foreknew you, he did what to? He predestined you. If he predestined you, he called you. If he called you, he justified you. If he justified you, he glorified you. Right. And then the writer says, this is what Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And so does it really, I mean, is Paul trying to make us feel as if this justification is in our future to be decided upon by us? Or is he saying this is based upon God's foreknowledge, which says if I foreknew you, I actually predestined you, and if I predestined you, 
I actually called you. And if I called you, I justified you. If I justified you, I glorified you. No, I, 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 agree, with, I agree with what you're saying. Um, that that, that be, because God, know, God knew the future and God knew who would come to him, that he justified them, that he, that he sanctified them, and he, and, and he did everything that you're talking about. Um, yeah, I have, I have not, no problem with what you're saying. So is, is he saying, oh, he foreknew those who would choose him? Or is he talking about, I foreknew everyone? Uh, mm-hmm. According to that text, well, I, I can make an argument for both, but just for the sake of this conversation, um, yes, he foreknew those who would come to him. So and that means because that of that, there's he a, justified them. I'm sorry. That means that it's a select, right? Like, is that the implication here? Like, it's the, it's the difference between uh, foreknowing everybody because he knew, because he knows everything, he, that everybody is included in who he foreknew, or is it the, the fact that uh, people were predestined and selected by him to come oh, okay. To okay, I see what you're talking about. Uh, I I'm think just asking. That, I, no, no, no. That, that, like, that, go ahead. That seems, that's a real good question. Um, uh, because God knew in advance who, um, who would come and who would not come, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul is saying that, 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 that those people are the ones that he predestined. You know what I mean? It's not so much because um, he wanted to be picky. Okay, I want you, and and and, and, and I, I don't want you, and I want you, and I want you. No, he 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 had he had foreknowledge on who would come and who would not come. So the people that he knew would come, he did all of those th- all of those things for them. He pre he predestinated them, he justified them, sanctified them, saved them, and everything else that that um, Doctor Jones was speaking about. So that's a super interesting point, if you don't mind me interjecting, because. Um, all right, so I'm going to put on the, the theist glasses. And, and for those purposes, um, God is beyond time, right? Yes. Um, so like past, present, future, that means, that means nothing. That only means things to us because we're temporal beings and, and God is not a temporal being. So right. if I can paraphrase what you're saying, and, and I, I hope I can, um, you're kind of saying that it's not so much that he selected I want you, I don't want you, I want you, I don't want you. It's just that he knew. He, he, he put the message out there through the death of Jesus. He put mm-hmm. the message out there and he made a path for people to come to him. And exactly. some people will and some people won't. And because God knows everything, past, present, and future, he, he knows who is going to pick up what he's throwing down, so to speak. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Because I, I exactly. that's very different than... An interpretation of this, which could go along the lines of, well, God, because God chose, right? The, the choose part, I guess, is the weird verb that makes it sound like, yes, I choose you and not you and choose you and not you. But what you're really kind of saying is, hey, the message that I put out there is going to resonate with some people. And I already kind of know who, who it's going to resonate with. And those yeah. are the people that I'm glorifying and justifying. Yeah, and predestination, the, 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 the doctrine of predestination is a tricky, tricky doctrine. There's a lot of disagreement in, in Christianity over oh, that really? particular uh, topic. I try to avoid it like the plague, but, you know, there's it, a lot of disagreement in the body of Christ regarding that. I mean, if I brought my Christian friends on this, on this hangout and we spoke about this, they'll probably disagree, disagree with my attitude toward it. Um, but it's, it's just a tricky, 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 tricky um, uh, theology. Uh, we, I appreciate we, you exploring it a little bit with us. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. that, that, I mean, this has been wonderful. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, uh, but I would like to, if, if you're game, I would like to explore the rest of chapter 3 all the way through John 3.16 because, you know, John 3.16 says this term or, you know, uses this term eternal life and John chapter 17, verse 3 uh, Jesus, it seems like he's defining it. And if you would, just for the sake of reading it, can you read John chapter 17, verse 3 to me uh, slowly? John chapter 3, verse 17. Just give that, me that's one. John chapter 17, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. Okay, just yeah, give let, me one second. And, and let's ask ourselves if Jesus is defining eternal life. Okay. Um... John 17, verse 3. Okay. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So okay. I, I, um, I, I, w- w- would you agree that that would be an adequate definition or understanding of eternal life? 
I wouldn't have a problem with this definition um, at all. Um, I think there's more that can be said about it, but, but, but I'm fine with just this one verse here. So if, could, could, could it be possible that John 3.16 is talking about, and, and just bear with me, I'm, I'm trying to understand where you're at. Uh, when, when you're comparing eternal life to something that might be the opposite of it, possibly, and you place that in juxtaposition, not just in contrast, but side by side to make a point. Uh, if you're talking about um, eternal life in the context of, uh, oh, you know something as opposed to not knowing something. And see, John chapter 3, you know, it appears that you know, darkness has a problem of comprehending. For instance, all throughout this, this book called John, uh, let, let me read you a couple of passages, like in John chapter 14. Um, in, in chapter 14, verse 25, these things I have spoken unto you, being uh, yet present with you. But when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I have said unto you. If you skip over a couple of chapters, he it, it sounds like he's saying the same thing, but, but trying to phrase it differently to nuance the point. In verse 12 of chapter 16, he says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It sounds like these people are really having a hard time wrapping their mind around what he's saying. So he says, how be it when he, the, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you into all truth. And it, it sounds like these people are having an extremely difficult time understanding Jesus. And so I guess my point is, when you go back to chapter 3 and he's talking with Nicodemus, is Nicodemus really understanding the teachings and the points, all of the parables that Jesus is offering? Nope. Or are these people, you know, very much people in darkness who are saying, I can't understand light, I can't understand light. And is Jesus saying, I have this prerequisite so you Jews can go to heaven and the rest of humanity can go to heaven? Or is he saying, I've got a prerequisite that I would like to put on the table so you can understand my points? Mm, that's the case. That's the case. And, 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 and if I can fast forward a little bit um, back to what you were saying about the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit. OK, a lot of times uh, when, when, when Christians are speaking to people who don't believe, they say, well, you can't understand the, um, the Bible because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Um, I think what they're trying to say to them a lot of times is that is that it's hard for you to grasp what we're talking about concerning the kingdom of God, salvation, um, 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 what it means to be a follower of Christ versus you know, what, wherever they are in life right now and be able, and be able to just be, to be able to comprehend things that we would deem as evil in the Bible or things that we disagree in the Bible. You know what I mean? And right. if you have the Holy Spirit, you can understand these things um, on a, on a deeper level. Don't get me wrong. Uh, um, you can be a non-believer, go to seminary school and get a good understanding of what the Bible is saying about um, some of the things that's going on in the Bible. But, from 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 my theology, or rather from my from, from from where I'm coming from, without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to to be able to accept, I suppose, um, um, some of the hard truths that are in the Bible. You're not going to be able to 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 get the deeper meanings of it, um, um, the greater lessons out of what happened in the scriptures. You know, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm going to interrupt a little bit and and address a little bit of an elephant in the room, um, Dr. Jones. If I'm if I'm hearing you right, it seems like you're framing a lot of you're pointing out a lot of scripture and you're framing your questions in such a way that you're really addressing the cognitive component of everything. Right. Because the, just just think of the words that are being used, knowing, um, understanding, you know what I mean? These are very psychological variables that are that that are being talked about as compared to like actions. Right. Um, so I, I, I think this is this is adding a layer of um, of nuance to, to, to the Bible for me. That's really interesting, because wh what are we talking about when it comes to getting into the kingdom of God? Are we talking about a cognitive variable, which means understanding something or knowing something and having to be justified in order to understand and know in the capacity that you know you're going from darkness to light, and I mean, 
I think that what we do sometimes, uh, sometimes if you're meeting with a Jehovah's Witness, you know, you, if you want to be kind to them, that is to have a conversation, you may need to use some of their terms just to make sense to them. The same thing is true with a Muslim or, you know, possibly someone from a different country. You want to get on the same page with them quickly. And, and I'm not convinced that Jesus wasn't just using a lot of the theological rhetoric simply to to move people forward. And it seems like these people were struggling because, in a sense, you know, they have this confirmation bias. They have, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance. They don't want to look at things, and they're stuck in Jerusalem. And, and Jesus, in a sense, seems like the kind of person who loved not just, you know, his family and, and neighbors, but he wanted people to love their enemies. And let's, you know, let's think about it. Maybe if we left Jerusalem and went in, into the mountains and explored other avenues, this might be a wonderful thing to do. But you're not going to be able to do that unless certain prerequisites are met. And so the conversation is, can we have a good conversation without certain prerequisites met? And I, I think that all of you, uh, both of you, will say that there has to be prerequisites met in every conversation that is for it to be one of respect, et cetera. And so... Uh, can, and can I say something on behalf of the atheist community? Certainly. Yeah. Um, in order for... Because uh, 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 this is something I've learned over the, over, uh, <laughs> over the last year with, with dealing with... Well, not the last year, the last six months dealing with the atheist community. Um, in order to be able to understand their arguments or to be able to um, have a conversation with them or to be able to see anything from their perspective... You do have to some. You do have to to some degree uh, be able to like. Okay, I got to stop like thinking like a theist for a little bit. I got to start thinking like they do in order to be able to understand, you know, where they're coming from and why they believe in the sciences so much and why they hold so dear to like, you know, uh, uh, how to get evidence through the scientific method and 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 why they don't believe that God exists. You, you have to put their shoes on to some degree in order to be able to understand what their life how their life is why they why they don't believe or why they think the concept of god is a is, is a bad idea and it's the same thing well it's similar to uh to, to being born again because 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 um you you have to come to a point where you're just like you know what god i believe you there's just this 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 just makes too much sense you know um um based on what you're showing me about sin i just believe you now now help me understand the rest of this you know what i mean so just like when somebody becomes an atheist, Chris, um, I don't know if you're going to agree with me with this. When somebody becomes an atheist, they have to come to a point where they're just like, you know what? I no longer believe this stuff no more. OK, I believe what this side is saying. They're making compelling arguments about uh, about, you know, evolution, the Big Bang, how everything got started. Rather, um, um, they, they have compelling arguments about um, about God not existing, how it probably probably makes more sense to live this kind of lifestyle versus this. You know, and, and there has to be that decision to believe what it is that you're hearing. You know? Yeah, I, I, I follow exactly what you're saying. I think that it's more for some atheists than others because, you know, uh, for all I know, there are plenty of uh, uh, free thinking uh, atheists that were raised in a free thinking atheist household. So, like, the, that right. decision that you're talking about might not have really happened, but, but for a lot of people, you know, um, that deconverted, if you will. Um, mm -mm. Or, or the flip side, of the co flip side of the coin, converted to atheism, right? Um, right. Yeah, a decision has to be made. Um, where something is, you know, between the variables that are being balanced in your mind, this set seems to have a little more gravitas and bona fides than these do. And um, in the same sense that you're talking about, I, I think that you're doing a service by engaging in the thought experiment that you just described, right? Which is, hey, you know what, in order for me to even understand why the scientific method is so important, let me shed my theist glasses, let me take them off, and let me put the atheist glasses on, and then from there look at it, and oh, okay, cool, I'm gonna gain a little insight. Now I know why they think this has so much value. I still disagree with it, but I mean, <laughs> I, I think that engaging in those thought experiments are completely vital to the kind of conversation we're having right now. Right. And I kind of, and I would like to implore the atheist community to do the same, because um, as an atheist, I'm not seeing so much of that. I'm not seeing so much, and this is something I wanted to bring up, and I'm sorry, Dr. Jones, because I'm a little bit on a soapbox right now, but please humor me for one minute. Um, <laughs> I would like to say that um, 
in general, when atheists are talking to theists, one of the main points that they don't get, which is, which is the most obvious, um, in my opinion, is the fact that the theist believes and has faith, period. That's where it begins for them. That's where it begins. Everything else manifests from that central point outward. And it seems like when atheists talk to theists, they want to start wrestling with the things that are outward instead of the core from which it manifests from. And it's like they don't, their, their questions are almost um, willfully ignorant of the fact that the person they're talking to has a faith and belief that changes the kind of question that they're asking to seem a little more loaded than even their, you know, they're, they're, they have a blind spot to it. So that's it. I'm done saying what I have to say. Um, but, you know, I, I do I do think that running those thought experiments, G-Man, are absolutely vital to the level of conversation that I'm hoping that you agree with we're having right now and that we all want to pull people up to. So Yeah, and I would say that the people here, uh, that, that yourself and um, – and, and, and anyone that would engage in something like this is just showing that they're mature and they're confident, you know, in, in, in what they believe. Because because I really do believe that that in order to uh, be able to see anything from anybody else's, you know, a point of view, you have to be able to walk in their shoes a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, um, like when I hear because uh, I don't want to go off topic when I hear some of uh, some of the things I hear on YouTube when people say, oh, you're probably a Christian because, you know, this stat says that, you know, you were born into a Christian. <laughs> oh, man. You know what I mean? And, and it just goes back to what you said. And I don't want to turn this into no, you know. No, I hear I, I'm going to have to say that for a lot of time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to have to interrupt you because we are way over time. Uh, yes. We were supposed yeah, to quit yeah, at yeah. Uh, 12 o'clock <laughs> uh, Central St uh, Standard Time. But it's been mm -hmm. wonderful having you here at the place, G-Man. Can we finish up next Sunday morning? I have no problem with that. 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I have no problem. I'm there. Okay. Uh, it's going to be, actually, we'll start at 11 a.m. Uh, um, well, it's, it's the same. He's talking Eastern Time. You're talking Central Time. Right. 11 okay. Central, 12 Eastern. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, well, uh, once again, uh, G-Man, it has been awesome having you on the show this morning. And we will be back next week with G-Man and also Christopher Mowdy. And for those of you who had to hang around too long, uh, just get used to it because the conversation is a healthy one. And we can have many, many more healthy conversations like this. And so take care. Stay. And your host, Rhonda Jones. And featuring the man who unchurched them all, Dr. Michael W. Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, when in the history of this green earth has this happened before? Tonight, we have extremely intelligent theists, atheists coming together to speak together civilly. Isn't that right, Greg? That's right. Oh, we forgot to light him up. He can't, he can't even talk back to me. So, in just a moment... We're going to have a fantastic discussion. Let's find out just, just who we have in our audience before we begin. Let's see. Sir, what, what, what's your name? Joe Phillips. Joe Phillips. We've got an incredible team here. We've got the team theists, team atheists. Whose team are you on? Theist. Theists. 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 You're on my team. You're on my team. All right. Any atheists here? Oh, fantastic. We are just, you guys are from the free thinkers, aren't you? This is the Pensacola Free Thinkers right here. Let's give them a hand. Yeah, fantastic. What was your name? Alan. Alan? Fantastic. Greg loves you. Greg, tell Alan that you love him. Tell Alan that you love him, Greg. And in that way, too. All right. All right. Without further ado, it's time to get started. We're going to hand this over to Dr. Michael W. Jones, and the discussion is going to ensue. Stay with us. I'd like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. 
I have to be honest with you, I can't claim that this is the place of intellectual honesty or spiritual honesty or scriptural honesty. I think that it's simply a presupposition on our part that is presupposing, that is based upon our perspectives of what honesty is. And so we hope to move forward in what honesty or our perception of honesty. And so in doing so, I hope that we can have a very meaningful conversation tonight. We have various people on our show. And um, I think that if we can take enough time to allow each other simply to finish sentences and things of that nature, I think that uh, much can be accomplished in the next two hours. And so without further ado, I would like to, to welcome everyone to the show. Uh, first of all, we have someone by the name of David Silverman. He's actually the president of the American Atheist Association, and he is joining us tonight, and I would like for him to say hello. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you, and thank you for having me on the uh, show. It's, it's wonderful to have you, David, and... I'm hoping that we can answer the question, and I'm sure that it's going to be much variegated tonight. The topic is, is church harmful? And so uh, we also have other hosts uh, who will share my position with me, not theologically speaking, but they will share the hosting position, and that would be Bob Graves. He's actually a professor in New York, and Bob is actually a linguist. And so welcome, Bob, to the show. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to uh, all that we can accomplish by uh, the dialogue together. And uh, we've got a, a just a tremendous crew from what I've been uh, hearing about, all the different people we have. So uh, I'm hoping this is uh, just a very fruitful discussion. Uh, we also have Greg Bray. Greg Bray is our resident atheist. Uh, most people will say, well, Dr. Jones, aren't you a theist? Yes. Uh, do you not have the New Covenant group? Yes, we do. But we include atheists and theists alike. We're not biased. We simply want a conversation that can go on that is meaningful. And so I want you to welcome Greg Bray, our <laughs> resident atheist. And he's actually a biologist, believe it or not. So welcome, Greg, to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And on a note of credibility, I did want to say that, yes, I am an atheist, and I'm part of the New Covenant Group. I do host a show called Inspiring Honesty from 6 to 7 um, that was on earlier tonight. So I, I am part of this group and I'm really excited to be part of this ongoing series and excited to have the guests that we have along with us today. So that's looking forward to it. Now, sitting to my right is a very famous person. He's a personality all over the world, and I mean, I need his autograph after the show. His name is Eric Hoven, and he's the president of Creation Today. And so say a few words, Eric. Well, my name is Eric Hoven, and uh, I am the president of Creation Today, and it's exciting to be here uh, talking to both David and Greg. I had the pl pleasure of meeting Greg up in Green Bay, and uh, it was a little chilly up there for me, but got to meet him and really thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And I, I love having conversations with atheists. I think it's something that really can be fruitful. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm going to be, I am in the search for truth, absolute truth. And that's what I want to, uh, to make sure I rest my hat on is what is truth. A lot of people say you need to be open-minded. And I say, well, once you find the truth, you want to be closed-minded on the truth. You don't want to be open-minded once you have the truth. You want to close your mind on that. So that's really what I'm in the pursuit of, and I'm looking forward to this conversation tonight. Now, you brought an associate with you, and his name is Cy. I'm not convinced that I can actually articulate your last name properly. <laughs> and so, Cy, would you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? My name is Cy Tenbruggenkate, and I'm from Canada. And I met Eric about four years ago, and uh, we've done a lot of work in ministry together. And I was actually down uh, in Georgia with a group of friends of mine doing some work uh, with their ministry. And um, <clears throat> Eric told me about this exchange that he had with some um, well-known people, and he asked me if I'd join him for this uh, exchange. And I said I'd be more than happy to, and I'm really excited about it, looking forward to it. I run the ministry, the website, uh, proofthatgodexists.org, 
which might be very interesting for the atheists in this crowd. They might want to grill me on my proof, and uh, I'd like to be able to engage them on uh, the foundations of their worldview as well. Okay. Uh, tonight, I would like to start with David Silverman. I think that he has a lot to put on the table of a discussion. And without uh, any more hesitation, I want to get right into the dialogue about is church harmful? David, is church harmful? Well, when you're asking is church harmful, the real question is to whom is church harmful to the swindlers and liars and victims who run it? Probably not. It's probably pretty good to them. Uh, it allows them to take advantage of people. It allows them to uh, get into a position where they have a nice steady job, where nobody challenges their authority. Uh, to them, it's a good thing. Um, however, to the people who are sitting in the pews and to the society on the whole, uh, the church is very harmful. The church does no good except take credit for other people's good deeds. Uh, it sucks the uh, tax money out of the, out of the municipality while at the same time spreading misinformation to people who listen and, re and think it's real. Um, and not about, church is never about learning, it's about memorization, it's about indoctrination, uh, and it is about a lie. It is about a huge lie. Uh, whichever lie you're talking about, every, I'm not talking about the Christian church in general, I'm talking about all churches of all religions, all synagogues, all mosques, everywhere. They're all the same. They all do the same thing. They tell people things and people listen, even if they're just made up stuff off of an old mythological book and then they take money and then they take power and they don't pay taxes so yeah i think they kind of suck uh i wanted to bring greg into the conversation immediately and i wanted to get his thoughts on what you said initially greg can you address that please Yes, first, I, I did want to say that, uh, that, Dave, thank you for coming, and nobody's mentioned it yet, but he's had a very busy day, and it may not, or may not be able to make it through the entire show with us. His original commitment when we first planned the show was only until 9 o'clock Central Time, so if, if he ducks out in the middle of the show, that is planned that way, not him running away. Um, but on, on the note of what he just said, I, I do have to agree, and actually, I, I think I want to add a little bit to, to what he said is... I think that church is not just the institution where people are coming together in a, a, a way where one person has authority and takes advantage of other people, but I, I think of it as a verb. I, I believe that church is something that people do where two or more like-minded people come together and influence each other's thoughts in a way that is coercive and, and has a lot of groupthink, a lot of peer pressure to conform, and, and where questions are discouraged. And I think that that practice, even if it's not within a religious context, it's harmful. It is bad. And church in the religious context has been that to a T in almost every single situation. I'm having a hard time hearing here up on the stage. Uh, I'm going to go back to David. David, uh, when we had P.Z. Myers on the show, I simply asked him, is the church harmful? And he said, yes, it is. And he thought that was the end of the show. But I, <laughs> I, I said that I need a little bit more of an explanation. Let's get real specific. Let's not generalize anything. When you say that church is harmful, get extremely specific. Give me a list, if you will. Give you a list of how the church is harmful? Yeah, specifically, give me a list and how it's harmful, what it's doing, X, Y, and Z. Okay, the first thing it is doing is, is spreading misinformation. It is increasing the ignorance uh, and decreasing the value of critical thinking in the flock. And this is a huge problem. Again, increasing ignorance and decreasing critical thinking. This is how you get... I believe that because the, because the Bible tells me so. Uh, this is extremely damaging to the people. It is extremely damaging to the community. This is why we have a decreasingly poor, an increasingly poor, or I should say, an increasingly poor uh, education system. Uh, this is 
a, a major problem that we all have to deal with on a nationwide level. Uh, it does not talk about education. It does not talk about um, knowledge, but it says it talks about education and knowledge. Uh, so it misrepresents what it does and it misrepresents how it benefits communities and it misrepresents how it benefits to the people itself to the people and to the community and to the government at large. And it does so by taking more, it does so in the process of taking money out of the coffers. It does so on a tax-free basis because somehow people have determined that religions are good things. They're not. And the churches that run them aren't good things. They're not. Um, and that's something that I think we have to deal with on an individual level, on, on a locality level. When you say that the church is spinning ignorance, let me ask you a specific question concerning what Jesus said. Now, I understand that Jesus technically did not say this, that is, in Greek, but let me give you a term that the apostles used. They used this term ecclesia. Um, do you think the ecclesia is equivalent to the church? If so, why? I don't know. I don't know enough about the subject. I, I, I did not get that. Can you repeat that, please? I, I don't know what I don't know the word ecclesia. Okay, ecclesia is a Greek word that the church took. Well, I should say a group of people spinned the idea of church out of their meta language and it's an extremely failed meta language to say the least i don't find that the greek text actually supports the term itself and so when it comes to ignorance i'm against ignorance but i'm not so sure that all people who talk about church and talk about religion are actually educated as to what is the text or what the text says. And so my point is, if we're going to make a, a point about the church, and I think that we need to, if they are spinning church, and they are, and they do not have a syntagmatic nor a paradigmatic analysis that would provide us that ecclesia ever meant church in the first century, why are they spinning that kind of usage would be my question. Well, I mean, it, it's not about... Uh this is about what the knowledge that they're spreading in today's dates, in today's times. I mean, to the people here, what are they saying? They're saying God created the earth 7,000 years ago in a poof. We know this isn't true. They're saying evolution doesn't exist. We know this isn't true. When I say they're spreading ignorance, I'm saying they're spreading ignorance and, in many cases, absolute misinformation. And they're doing it on a regular basis. And that's not just the Christian church. I, I don't, are we talking only about the Christian church here? Or are we talking about churches in general? Because what I'm saying is uh, it affects everything. Mythology well, is mythology. I, and I'm, spreading it is spreading lies and spreading ignorance. That's I'm what I'm going through. Okay, I'm simply saying if the Greek text does not support the term church, that is in translation theory, because any time that you say that the term church comes from the Greek text, you're spinning a, a very synthetic model, something that was created much later in history. It, it's not something that Paul would have understood or any so of the writers. So you're saying the church is in the heart. The, the, the term church is an illiterate term in representation of the Greek text. And so when we have a, a, a chat about church, it's simply something that's spurious when it comes to the language of the Bible. That is, well, then, the manuscripts the themselves. The Sir? So what's the purpose of the title of this talk if church is so spuriously defined? Well, I'm simply saying that the church is what it is today. It is simply an institution. We can define it in various ways, and I would imagine that everyone you meet uh, would possibly define it in various ways. And I'm simply uh, with you on that it has been extremely deceptive, and it has killed uh, multiplied, I, I can't count the numbers, they're just too high, they would kill anyone who ever questioned their doctrines, etc. But I'm simply trying to make a distinction between possibly what the manuscripts say and what we're talking about tonight. And I think that that would be meaningful to maybe all of us, that is, if we're going to talk about ignorance. In other words, is it true? And this is one thing that I 
that I often ask atheists, you know, people say, well, I don't believe in God, and I, I'm asking all the time, well, you're dealing with a much secondary text, and you're not dealing with a primary text, and so when does a good scientist or a good thinker, someone who wants to be intellectually honest, ever make their conclusions without dealing with source uh, language documents? Well, then you're, Can I ask then you're subjectively that? choosing. Hold on a second. Then you're subjectively choosing on an individual level what part of the Bible is going to be more relevant than the other part of the Bible. That's not and true. If, well, I think, it, I think that's what you just said. No, it's not You're what I'm saying. I'm simply saying if we are to be linguistically honest about what the text says, not cherry-picking what I think to be true or what someone else thinks to be true, using linguistic science itself, when you go back and you look at the didactic and indexicality of the text itself and what is proved to be considered what the ecclesia is, that's one thing, and that's subsequent to what the idea of church is. Now, I've talked with you on the phone, and I agree with you that the church is harmful, but that's actually a subsequent issue concerning what the Greek manuscripts would articulate. But why is that important? Okay, so I, I, I just want to make sure, what is the subject of this talk? Are we talking about the churches today, the religions today? When we say, is the church harmful, are we talking about today's church, like you and I talk about church, or are we talking about churches as as you would say, might have been originally defined in the ancient Greek. Okay, we are talking about the term church, and since we're talking about the term church, the entity itself has imposed something that's very deceptive. It has claimed the ties that it goes back into the manuscripts, and we can't avoid the discussion of talking about the text itself. And so I'm simply advocating what you're saying in this, it has been deceptive. It has claimed that it was actually a first century usage, and this is part of the deception of the church. And I'm simply trying to advocate that you're quite right. It has been deceptive, both in what it has given us as a text and what it has given us in many various uh, in variance, uh, in, in, in various issues concerning the text. Can I uh, say something, Dr. Jones? Yeah, go for it. Um, you know, uh, some people are not th that familiar with the history here that um, the, uh, of course, uh, for a long time we had the Catholic Church. It was the only church that was, and it's actually created a, a history of itself that tries to project backwards all the way to supposedly Peter being the first pope. Um, that by the time that they were doing that, the church had become quite a, a, a cultural and social institution. But uh, I, I think that part of what you're saying is that when we look at the original documents, there was no concept of, of any institution associated with uh, you know, ecclesia. It was merely a way of describing um, uh, people who, you know, I mean, we can talk about people who have blue eyes, you know, um, and th th there's no institution for blue-eyed people. Right. Uh, we might end up with one, but uh, hopefully not. <laughs> but so uh, th that, that, in a sense, that that church was uh, is is an institution that became a cultural institution. But originally, there were simply people who had a, a a very similar belief, and it wasn't wasn't terribly organized. It wasn't. Uh, codified all that and but but it eventually grew into that so that when 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 church became that it was something very different than what it originally was at the time that the documents they claim perhaps you know give authority to it were, were involved let, let me make a, a comment here that uh, I we're all coming to this show every one of us has an agenda of some sort um, that's uh, we all have uh, a message that we're trying to convey, and I, I think that it's it's been clear through um, the last several shows that I've been a part of with you, Dr. Jones, that it, your your message here is that the way that Christians use the word church may not have necessarily been the way that it was intended when the original manuscripts were written. But I think that that David and I are coming from a different perspective entirely. That we don't care what the original intention of the church was, or or, or if the word church is even being used honestly. As a matter of fact, it might be a very appropriate term because it's a dishonest term. 
And so much of what churches do otherwise is also dishonest. As I said, I look at churches, at church as something that you do. I, I would actually venture that Eric and Sai uh, understand that church is harmful in every context except what they believe to be the true church. Is that accurate for you guys? You know, I, I don't think we've, I think David is on the right track here. We haven't really defined the terms enough to know exactly what we're talking about in order to make a solid conclusion. I mean, if it's all kind of just vague up in the air, you can't just say, is church harmful? Yes, because what are you talking about? Uh, church, my definition of church, would be uh, the body of believers, those that have, uh, have received the Holy Spirit. That is the church. So that takes kind of the whole different sects of religion um, out of the picture, and you put it back to, if I stick with my presupposition, which is the Bible, uh, I'm going to go back to what the Bible says church is. Church is the gathering together of people that have trusted Christ as their Savior and have received the Holy Spirit. And anybody that, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, anybody that says Jesus Christ is not God has not received the Holy Spirit. So I would go back to that definition. Now, you know, is church harmful? I mean, unless you're Bill Clinton, you don't really need to worry about the definition of is, right? Uh, church, we've got to worry about that definition. So what church are we talking about? And then harmful, what, what is harm? I mean, um, just for, for Mr. Silverman, for Dave, what he said there, you know, his, his, to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mr. Silverman, but it sounds like you're, Main thing so far is the misinformation and uh, the misinformation I, and the misuse of power. Yes. Okay, um, and it decreases critical thinking. Um, so, you know, my question along those lines would be simply: Are you against all misinformation? I mean, do we, you know, got to go to your reason rally that you were the chair of last year, and I appreciated that. I had a great time there. Um, but are, do we go? You know, do we go out there and try to go against Santa Claus? And do we go against these other things that are all any any misinformation, or is it certain misinformation? So that's I'll, but, I'll but, let Cy but, jump in here. But, but just, let me let me interject something before we go too far because I think that Greg was trying to say that we need definition. Well, here's the problem with this: if I ask 15 people what church means to them, we're probably going to get 15 different definitions. And yes. that becomes a problem. So we better and figure so, out which one we're going to well, use for this discussion. Well, this, this discussion needs to be about there are, I mean, let, let's deal with it like this. We need to consider etymology. We need to consider diachronics. We need to si consider synchronics. And if we don't consider well, it we all, consider we're not being intellectually today, honest. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be intellectually honest about the linguistics of it all. Because if we're not, we're simply playing a shell game. Correct. And so which is my, why I want to know which one are we... That's what Dave wants to know. Which one are you talking about? When he says, hey, you're looking at the church subjectively, Dr. Jones, I'm going, yeah, I, I don't know which one you're talking about yet either. Okay. Right now, I'm simply wanting someone to commit and say, this is exactly what I'm talking about specifically. This is the church that I'm talking about, and here's how I define it. And so, uh, Dave, if you would, would you be so kind to clearly define what you mean by church and then take it from there? Because I, I, I'm enjoying your, your points, and I agree with much of it. Okay. Uh, this is very good. I'm glad we got to this early because when, when, when you and I were first talking, we were clearly talking about two different things. I'm really glad we got into this. I am defining church as a, uh, a layman would define church, only in the most generic sense. I am defining church as a building uh, uh, which has a congregation, which preaches a religion. And that includes all religions. I include, when I say church, just in general, I use that as a generic term, not as a Christian term. Uh, so I include the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, uh, the Sikhs, the Branch Davidians, Scientologists, all of it. A building, um, an entity, uh, a self-imposed, a self-defined self entity, a corporation, um, which brings in people, a five, probably 501c3 religious organization, brings in people, tells them wrong things deliberately, takes their money, and promises, that promises, makes promises that 
absolutely positively will not be kept and sends them on their way with less with uh, less knowledge that they had when they came in uh, with less critical thinking skills and with less money that is what i define a church as i do not care personally uh, how it was defined and how far it has strayed i'm talking about today's church in the most generic sense so i'm assuming that you haven't sent much money to benny hinn is that correct not very much, no. Not very much, okay. Uh, I, think, uh, if you don't mind, I want to nuance one point, too. Dave, you were not raised as a Christian, correct? Correct. I was raised as a Jew. So you're bringing a different perspective to, I think, everyone, uh, there are all of the rest of us in here were raised as Christian um, in various forms. So thank you for bringing that perspective as well. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you my one joke. Um, I'm named David Silverman. My parents were originally going to name me Jew, but they decided it wasn't Jewish sounding enough, so they called me David Silverman instead. <laughs> That's good. That's I think good. Was, um, sorry. Uh, Cy wanted to jump into the conversation, and I, I want to yeah. give him the microphone. Go I'm just going to say I think it's very important when we have this discussion that we talk about standards. And when we're talking about the church, we're talking about the bride of Christ. Um, it says in Scripture, for whom Christ died. So I think the, the question actually at some level is offensive because if I were to approach somebody and say to them, is your wife a prostitute? You wouldn't start off with that. You'd start off with definitions. And I'm saying that without the standard of Scripture that you don't have an absolute definition of anything. And uh, I don't know how much time since there's so many people on the panel, so I would like to ask uh, David Silverman something since um, he's made many claims. And I'd just like to know from uh, Mr. Silverman if he could be wrong about everything he claims to know. If I could be, I could wake up in the matrix tomorrow. So is, is that a yes? Uh, could so you be? I can't prove it won't happen. No, but could but you I, be? I find it, I find it amazing, side that we're just in the beginnings of the definition, and you're already claiming to be offended by the definition. No, no, I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm offended by it. I'm just saying that on some level, it can be offensive since you're talking about the bride of Christ. You know, the Lord who I'm adore, who I adore, who. He died for this church. So I'm, I'm not offended by this, but I'm saying that at some level you have to consider that, that if I went up to somebody and said, is your wife a prostitute, that that would not be the way to start the conversation. But if we could just get a, def a definitive answer from you, I, I would appreciate that. Could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Possibly. So it's possible that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know. See, now that's it's possible. Look, look, look. When you're getting into this, when you use the word no in that sense, you're, you're using two definitions at the same time, okay? I could exactly. wake up in the matrix tomorrow, okay? The matrix could be true. I can't prove it's not. Uh, I could wake up in the movie tomorrow and then, oh my goodness, reality has changed. That could happen. Do I know with 100% certainty that that's not going to happen? No, I don't. Does that mean the matrix is actually plausible? No, it doesn't. Well, so I know with 100% certainty that God doesn't exist. I know that with exactly the same certainty that I know that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Now, if Santa Claus lands on my roof, I'll believe. Do I think that's going to happen? No. But you see the contradiction, though, when you say that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, and then you say you can know things for certain. And let me explain that, yeah, if you don't mind. for certain is a relative term. For well, certain is the problem is you could be wrong about that. That's the problem. Matrix. Okay, so I, hey, can I, I, I we know, want to comment here that uh, uh, it is wrong? taking away the possibility that we could be, you know, in some sort of dream, that we could just think up, that we could just dream up. We have knowledge. We know things. And I know things, and so do you. Well, that's right. But the thing is, I say, you're borrowing from my worldview, because it says in Scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And if you admit that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, then you've given up knowledge. And I'll, I'll explain why that is. Let's say somebody well, asked, sorry, what would this be? Before we well, let me finish. I, I think that we, we were told we were going to cut each other off. Okay, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Okay, that, just, just a minute. Hold on. This is very, very common rhetoric for you and Eric. And, and Eric and I had a conversation about what the term no even means for almost two hours last time he came on the show. Uh, and a, what's significant here is that it, already what we've done is, is Dave gave his definition of what he meant when he said church, and then you went into church as the bride of Christ. He was going uh, all the way across all religions as, as an institution, and you, you've redefined that already. So I, I want to stick more to that than on the Am I gonna your, be allowed to finish standard my rhetoric of is, is anything knowable? Because it's, it, it's admittedly circular reasoning. You have admitted this. Eric has admitted it. Well, hey, Greg, we, in we the haven't. End, what you're going to say yeah, is, 
if you don't you, to know anything, you have to know somebody who knows everything. And that person needs to have a rule that they can't lie. And by doing that, you can trust that person to tell you anything and you can know then absolutely. The problem with that, I'm just addressing your entire argument right here right now, is that you would need to know that that person knows everything and you would need to know that that person cannot lie. So you're still depending on your own personal knowledge. It, it's a feedback loop in the end. Either you admit that there's no such thing as absolute knowledge or you're trusting yourself and to project yourself. Okay, but, 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 but for the sake of keeping this, this discussion with clarity, let's not move too quickly into a different subject. I think David was simply saying that church is all over the place, if I'm not mistaken, and he was taking a broad stroking uh, manner of defining the church, you know, whatever you practice, whether you're a Muslim, a Hindu, et cetera. Am I understanding that correctly, David or David? Yes, yes, you are. Um, and I can change my definition and change my points if you'd like to talk for me to talk just about the Christian church, um, but... Uh, I think the point that I want to make is that all the church, it's all the same to me. And I think Greg was making this point. Uh, this is all the same as, as far as we're concerned. Christian churches, Muslim churches, uh, Muslim mosques, Jewish synagogues, it's all the same. And to me, it's all church. Okay. Now, I would like for these two guys to make the hard-hitting punches that they enjoy making. And I want people to be able to get finished with their sentences. I want you to finish what you're saying. I want Cy to be able to finish with what he's saying and Eric. And, and Bob, get in here. I mean, you have something to say before we move on. Sure, Jump in yeah. here for a moment. In fact, some, something I'd like to just, just mention at this point in time. Um, I, I want us to be careful about uh, the possibility of a bait and switch that uh, theologically uh, most Christians would define the church as that mystical body of believers, and that's how they would talk about it uh, scripturally. Uh, but uh, then at the same time, they, they often don't uh, make a distinction that when you find on the corner is this building and it's called, say, First Christian Church or, or First Baptist Church or something like this, that that church is an organization that has a creed, it has a charter, it has documents, and it actually exists as a legal entity of some sort. It's a 501c3 organization. Uh, it has a bank account. It has assets. This is a church, too. And when we're talking about this mystical body, and I think do with that church. Um, but so um, I, I don't want us, uh, when, if we're going to take... Um, you know, if we're going to talk about the, the offense of the Bride of Christ. I don't see that building on the church having anything to do theologically with, the, with the, say, the Bride of Christ. Uh, but I do see that that church sitting on the corner, having regular meetings, having a hierarchy, having a theology, a creed, as being some sort of a social institution other than the fact that the people there believe they are part of the Bride of Christ. So we are talking about two different things, and I don't want us to do the bait and switch. So when I'm talking about is church harmful, of course, I am a theist. I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. But... I don't believe in the institutional church as being that which Jesus founded. And so consequently, that building on the corner, its hierarchy, its creed, and all that stuff strikes me as being nothing but humanistic nonsense. And, um, you know, so, and, and when I think about church as harmful, that's what I'm thinking about, that. But the idea that there are people who believe in Jesus and all that and are part of a mystical body, that, that to me is an entirely different question. And, and I think that uh, for me, you know, I can make a difference between those two concepts. Now, Dave, we have two people here who want to disagree with you. And Only they... two? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, I'm sitting here trying to moderate because they are eager to go, and I don't want to censor them. I don't want to censor you. I want both. I, I want everyone to be able to finish their sentences. 
Okay. Uh, and their points. I want to put everything on the table. It's not logical for us just to bully our theology or our mindsets against theology. This is the place for intellectual honesty. This is why I was trying to call into question the idea of what church means etymologically uh, and synchronically and diachronically. And so it's, it's all over the place. It's much variegated. <coughs> However, we do have Cy and Eric who want to do what actually uh, Greg has been wanting. He wanted someone to take a position, a particular position of the church, define it and defend it. And since you, uh, Dave, and also Greg think that the church is harmful, and I do to a large degree, I would like to hear, if you guys are game, what they have to say. What do you think, Dave? Uh, I'm, I'm willing to hear what they have to say. Uh, I just want to make sure that I know what they're talking about. But, yeah, let's hear it. Okay. Uh, Cy, go for it. Well, I think Eric wanted to say something. First Let me just jump in. Go for it, Eric. A, a lot of what we're already talking about here, and I, I appreciate, Dave, you wanting to get a solid definition because uh, um, well, I'll be real, real candid here. I just got in an argument with my wife, and uh, to be honest— a lot of the arguments we have, if you're married, um, Dave, you got a wife, uh, Dr. Jones, you got a wife, uh, unless you get down to the bottom of, okay, what exactly happened? What exactly are we talking about here? Uh, it doesn't do any good. And you know how those arguments go with your spouse when it's, you're talking up here and, and really the, the, what happened is down here, but you guys, you're already so far past it, it's, it's hard to see it. So that's what I want to get back down to is, is the very, very foundation. So Dave, you gave a definition of church. I gave a definition of church. So, I think so in a way, of... Eric, what you're saying is having a conversation is similar to having a relationship. Well, yeah, you could and say so that. And so the way that you relate to Dave needs to be so loving and kind. I and hope he it is. to you and Cy. And Cy. this should be a love feast in a sense. And so let's go for it. And be so... careful how I use that word in today's <laughs> okay. culture because Mr. Linguist over here knows that that can mean a lot of things. Okay, uh, uh, you but... guys go for it for a brief period of time well, I just because like I want to... to get Dave back into the conversation. But go for it. Make your points brief, but make them clear without any kind of ambiguity. What I'd like somebody to do who's watching is actually time the amount that we are allowed to speak compared to everybody else on the show. <laughs> I realize I'm a nobody, but I had a sentence that 15 minutes ago I tried to finish and I still could not finish, so I'd like to do that now. Now, when David said he could be wrong about everything he claimed to know, he gave up knowledge. And the reason for that is, let's say that I ask, what's the speed of the road out here? And somebody says to me, it's 30 miles per hour, but I could be wrong. If you could be wrong, you don't know it. And that's the problem. When you say that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, you've given up knowledge to any degree. Now, if he says that he can be certain about things, then I would ask him how he could be certain about things. He would have to employ his senses and reasoning, and I'd ask him how he knows they are valid. And if he could be wrong about everything he claims to know, he can't know that they are valid. And that's the problem. I know that uh, it was uh, Greg that interjected as well, and I'd like to ask him that question just to get that on record. Could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Hey, again, I... I, I I have. I know where you're going with this, I, and I believe I addressed everything, is that, yes, we all can be wrong about everything that we claim to know, including you and Eric, but you're inserting God in as a virtuous circle into your okay. circular now, here, argument. Now, so let I, me just, I just am trying to address right. it before it comes up, because it's a big sidetrack that we can get caught up in quite some time. Right. But we, before we go on, though, when you say you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, you said yes— the very next thing out of your mouth was a knowledge claim about me. And if you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, then you can't know what I can know. And this discussion Tell me, here, is, it, is it accurate, though, that you believe that your knowledge well, comes from God? What I'm saying, what I'm saying if, you, if you claim that you could be wrong about everything that you claim to know, you've given up knowledge. So any further discussion tonight presupposes my worldview. Because... You would have to be intellectually dishonest to say that. No, it doesn't well, we're well. going to allow us to finish our thoughts, yeah, let's right? Finish the sentence. You'd have to be intellectually dishonest to claim that an all-knowing, all-powerful being could not reveal things to us such that we can know them for certain. So according to my worldview, I can have certainty. And the two of you have denied knowledge. You've given up knowledge. So really, any further discussion is going to be based on the truth of my worldview. Can I uh, maybe can interject a, a, uh, a monkey wrench in this? I am going to arrogantly assert that it's absolutely impossible that I am wrong about everything I know. I think that is an absolutely absurd impossibility. 
Um, as to exactly uh, what is wrong and what I think, I suppose that uh, knowledge in some ways is, uh, is growing, but knowledge means so many things. For example, uh, I know that I exist, and I can't possibly be wrong about that. It's just not even possible. Um, I know that my experience, even if inaccurately perceived, is still nonetheless absolutely my experience. And I know that, and I know that absolutely. And I also believe that from that we can build things with a level of probability. When we go from, can you be absolutely certain about everything, to you can't be absolutely certain about anything, you have made a jump of logic there that is horrendous. And I find that to be a just an untenable argument. Well, I'd like to address that before we go on because he's accused sure. me of a logical fallacy. And he says that he can know things for certain. So I'd like to know, when you claim that you know that you exist, could you, are you using Descartes' syllogism there, I think, therefore I am? No. Okay, then how I'm do you know that you exist? Pardon me? How do you know that you I, exist then? Because my own consciousness. But you realize you're begging the question when you say my own. Truth. When you say my own, you're begging the question. You're assuming that you exist. When you say my own consciousness, you're assuming existence and you're well, begging the question. Just as you said he was assuming your worldview, for you to even tell me that I'm assuming that I exist is an acknowledgement that I exist. Right, but the thing is, I can make sense that of that. I unless I did. Right, is I can make sense of your existence truth? according to my worldview. I'm asking you how you make sense of your existence according to your but, worldview. Well, let me ask you about your worldview, Sai. Well, you're actually out of the discussion because you said you could be wrong about everything you claim to know. I, I'm so I'm, I'm dealing with the okay, person who claims certain. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Play by that role. One of the things yeah, that I don't want to happen. Piece. Hold on, hold on, guys. Hold on. Hello. Uh, we can talk. We can interrupt, and we can not have complete thoughts finished, etc. We're not going to get anywhere, and so I have promised everyone that we are going to have complete thoughts and an opportunity to address. X, Y, and Z. Uh, Sai has made some points. He's asked some questions, and I think that there has been various responses. Um, I, I want you to ask this question of Bob again, and Bob, please answer that, and then I want to go back to Dave Silverman. I think that he deserves to be heard concerning uh, your position here. Let me ask one quick question before we, we go into that, though. Sai, how is what you're talking about related to the topic, is church harmful? Well, How because in order to have a discussion about anything, we have to have a foundation of knowledge and truth. And when I say the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and if I have a discussion with you and that you claim that you can know things, I'm denying my worldview from the outset because I'm saying you have to start with God in order to know anything. And the fact that you make knowledge claims exposes that you know that God exists, that there are no such things as atheists because the thing is you have claimed that you can be wrong about everything you claim to know and you make knowledge claims which is inconsistent with atheism. And I'm saying I'd be happy to discuss this if you say we're doing it on the basis of my worldview that you've already given up knowledge, then I'll be happy to talk about the church. Well, I, I think what you're going to end up getting is a, a, a rejection of your premise that we have to accept your worldview. But you could be wrong um, about that. Uh, uh, sure, uh, but we, we don't need to agree on anything before we, we move on. We, we can discuss things based on a, an assumption that our knowledge is valid enough to continue the conversation. It doesn't need to be absolute for it to be relevant to what we're talking about right now. And we're going to, uh, we could, we only have Dave committed for 10 more minutes here. We could spend again, hours talking about what people know. You're doing bulleted questions to try to pin us down and and it's uh, going to eventually just eat up the entire show. So I'd like to just stick to the question at hand. I know you would. <laughs> All right, ladies well, and gentlemen, you were uh, before, on the show we continue, before we continue, uh, I just want to uh, hang up on Greg. He's getting an echo. I'm going to hang up on him and call him right back, okay? okay. While we're doing that, let me just make a, uh, a brief comment. Uh, I do want everybody to be able to finish their uh, sentences. That might actually be David Silverman. Let's turn him down for just a moment. Let's find out if it's him. I do. All right. I, I do want to be able to... Yes. Turn David Silverman all the way down. Slide him down for just a moment. I may need to call him back. Let me just say, everybody needs to be able to finish their sentences. But that doesn't mean that if you invite somebody into the conversation that they're not allowed to interact with you and you can't stop them from interacting with you if you invite them into that conversation. And uh, let me also say that, uh, that that doesn't mean that you need to control the conversation. Allow the moderator, please, to control the conversation. Thank you. 
Uh, Dave, are you there? Dave, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Now, you've heard quite a lot. Uh, we've gotten a little bit off topic here, and I want to know your thoughts about what has been stated thus far. Um, it's a distraction. It's a useless question. Uh, he is playing off. What, what theists like to do is they like to play off double meanings of the words, no and no, how much do you know things? Do I know Santa Claus won't land on the roof tomorrow morning? Well, no. Well, then you must believe in Santa Claus a little bit. It's, it's word games. It's really um, pedantic stuff. It's obviously, I mean, it's, it's obviously a distractionary method. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about, is the church harmful? He's trying to get on, get, you know, to distract the attention. Uh, he won't even talk about the subject matter unless we talk about the, the, the nature of the word no and how, wh what is 100% anyways, and how do you even know 100% is 100%? It's, it's, uh, it's gobbledygook, and it's, waste of, it's wasting our time, and we're not talking about the subject matter because of it. But you could be wrong about that. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> what I find interesting, Dr. Jones, is, like I said, when, when I get in an argument with my wife, I really want to know what is the bottom line? What, what, what is it? And that's really what I want to try to get at. Your question, is church harmful? Like I said, okay, is, uh, I'm not, Bill Clinton, I'm not going to argue over that. Church, yeah, we disagree the very uh, outset. Our premise of what the church is, we're talking about two different things. I'm using the biblical definition of the word church. Mr. Silverman is using the, the broad sense church at large. And so which one are we going to talk about? Uh, and then, then even the word, let me, let me finish this, even the word harmful, what is harm? I mean, when, when I look down here, and uh, the, the church is an institution. Um, we're, we're a couple different things that, uh, that he said as far as causing harm. I go... What is harm in, in an atheistic worldview? What is harm? What's wrong with, let me put it this way, what's wrong with misinformation is, is what I, you know, I would get to that point. But size going, hang on, once we've denied knowledge, does it do any good to have a conversation with somebody who has denied knowledge? Well, can I take up for you a minute, uh, Dave? Can I take up for you? Okay. Okay. Uh, Let's, uh, how, how quick are you going to be able to get him back up? I'm here. Okay, Dave, let me take up for you for a minute. Uh, I, I'm going to play the devil's advocate, if, if you will, and I'm going to ask uh, both Eric and Cy a few questions. Here are the questions that concern, I think, people like uh, Dave and also uh, Greg. You can go through the Old Testament, and you have passages like Elisha. He's walking down the road, and 42 children call him Baldy. And the prophet Elisha turns around, and he starts cursing the children, and God sends two she-bears to maul these children to death. And so the question would be, is that reasonable? Is that moral? Yes, it, and and and, and, and so so what you're saying it's moral to maul children to death, and see I think where Dave is coming from, where people like Greg are coming from, they can't see that as being moral. No, I, For instance, I can explain. Let, 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 let me finish my done. point. Yeah. When when you read about uh, the killing sprees throughout the Old Testament, and you read about the issue of rape in the Old <laughs> Testament, it says that if you take if, if a man rapes a woman and this, this man actually takes the rape victim's father and pays the father 50 shekels, uh, he is to marry the one he raped. And what does that make that rape victim feel like? And so I think that Dave's position, and I may be misunderstanding his position and Greg's, I think that they're saying that doesn't sound logical, it doesn't sound moral, it doesn't sound sane. And when you take the story of Noah, the killing of all but eight, uh, here is a God who creates children in the Bible. Uh, we have God's created children. He starts resenting his children. 
and he kills all of humanity except for eight people. And it seems like when you read the Bible, you go from one killing spree to the next. The first king of Israel, for instance, he's told to, uh, let's go kill the Amalekites, the men, the women, the children, and also the infants. And this is with a sword. And so I've even had a priest on my show who, would, who actually claimed that if God told him to go kill infants, he would do so in the name of God. And I, I think that's what he's talking about, if I'm not mistaken. Am I misrepresenting what you're saying, Dave? No, I think you're on right. Go ahead. Okay. And so I, I think that he's worried about that kind of mindset that the church teaches people in Sunday school, because all these children, they go to Sunday school, they see all these wonderful pictures of Noah and the ark, and then this is a major killing spree. And so when you study the Bible, you see the doctrines of infanticide, genocide, slavery, the ordering of slavery. And so Dave and people like Greg are trying to reconcile that, and that doesn't make sense to them. And so, Cy, when you make the argument about knowledge, 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 and you pontificate dogmatically so, that this is the Word of God, right. uh, it, it doesn't make sense to people like Dave and Greg. And so uh, if I'm putting words in your mouth, Dave, uh, please correct me. I, I stand to be corrected. Let me give you a voice for a moment. Well, no, and unfortunately, I, we lost connection for part of that diatribe. What I heard, I liked. Um, the, the, the problem when we're talking about the Christian church is, yes, it's, it's not just the stories, though. It goes beyond that. It's the concept that the stories are perfect. And the problem behind Christianity, uh, really, is that they not only claim the stories to be true, but that they claim the stories to be perfect. Uh, and when science discovers that those ancient myths are wrong, uh, what Christian religion often does is dig their heels in and say, no, 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 our book is perfect. Uh, and, you know, we all know that there are lots of different variations. Um, but when they start saying that they're perfect, when they start saying that science is wrong, they've taken a step further. They've actually gone from spreading a lie to spreading ignorance. They've actually got people convinced that evolution didn't happen. We know it did. It's absolutely proven. 100% proven, Cy, by the way. But you could be Without wrong about that. <laughs> yes, we can, we, can, we can be sure about that. No, you said you could be um, wrong about everything, so you could be wrong about that, correct? Sorry, I was, inter I was speaking when you were interrupting. Yeah, I realize that, but we're allowed to interact, so continue. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, it, it, it's beyond just spreading lies. It's, not, it, it's beyond just spreading the lie that God exists, that there's a man in the sky. But now the Christian church specifically has said, no, 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 that which we know, that which we have learned— to be true, that which we have proven true is wrong. What really happened is that Noah sailed down to Antarctica to put the penguins back. And, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, a step beyond what you were saying, uh, Dr. Jones. Um, it, it's beyond the, the, the grotesque stories as morality and claiming it to be good. And it's, it's into the realm of of interfering with the progress of the, of the American people. And that's can I, wrong. Can I explain the, the issue with this? Yes. Is that when you bring up biblical stories like that, you're assuming a standard of morality which is above or outside of the Bible. And I'm saying outside of Scripture, you don't have a standard of morality by which you can judge those things. Now, these are great questions for a Bible study, but I don't do Bible studies with atheists. I do Bible studies with Christians who go on the authority of God's Word. And why, why would you not do a Bible study with an atheist? <laughs> because we're talking about the Word of God here. Yeah, but somebody why, who's given up but knowledge... Why will, would you not do a Bible study I will with proclaim an the truth of Scripture to an atheist, but when somebody says, I could be wrong about everything I, I claim to know, I'm not going to study the Bible with them because they could be wrong about that, and it's uh, Do you think that Jesus ignored the atheist? Oh, I don't, think he, I don't think he ignored do, do them Do you think all. that he, he ate... preached the gospel to them. But did he eat with the sinners and drink with the sinners, right, well, we're here. wash their feet, bow before them. Right. But let, let's get back to the topic at hand, these things that you call immoral. And when people say these things were immoral of God, you know, that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden, that 
that God said to Adam and Eve, do not eat of this fruit. Satan came along and said, hath God really said that? And what did Adam and Eve do? Adam, what did Adam and Eve do? They said, well, God said this, Satan said this, I'm going to decide. And that's exactly what people are doing today but, when, but, when they judge God in Scripture. Now, the thing is, we're not immoral, wicked people. We see these things and we conclude a loving God. And I say, if you don't like those things that happen in Scripture, if you're an unbeliever and you die in your sin, stick around. But, but the point is, you're, you're introducing... So your response is a threat? Your response to death no, is a threat? No, it's a warning. Is a threat? It's a no, warning. Come on. Tell me how we're supposed to learn morality, Cy, from an immoral book. You know morality. What is your standard by which you call anything immoral? I know bears ripping apart children is immoral, and I'm willing to go way out on a limb and say it's bad. Based, Amen. based Amen. on what standard? Based on what standard, Mr. Based Silverman? Based on my standard. And you could be wrong about that. No, I can't. Well, thanks for contradicting yourself yet again. Yep, that's me. Sai, I have a question for you. Go ahead. I, I, since it, oh, wait a minute. You've given up knowledge. Sorry. <laughs> We're done it, with it, you. Well, I'm asking you the question, though, um, so my knowledge isn't important. I, I'm really getting um, uh, it, It's only done. you. You are you the source next. of absolute <laughs> knowledge here, according to your worldview, or, or you have access to it. And I'd like to know how you know that. How do I know that? God makes yes. me know. God, oh, God makes you know that God exists? And the God thing is, do you, know, do you know how I can know things for certain? And I'll explain this to you, and it's going to be, you know, maybe a, a quite a big revelation to you. How I know things for certain? The same way you do, because we all know this God that exists. And you have to have all knowledge or revelation from a God who has all knowledge to know anything. Or you could be wrong about everything you claim to know, and you've given up knowledge. How do you know knowledge. that? And that's, what hap that's what's happened tonight. Okay, I... How do you know that? To be true? Right now, it's a little bit after nine. I don't know if Dave is going to stick around for the next hour. Are you, Dave, or do you no, need to I, leave? I, I've got to go. It's uh, a little after ten here. It's getting close to my bedtime. Can I get a couple of people from the audience to ask you just a question or two before you leave? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, step up to the microphone, and you can ask Dave a question. And would you present your name, uh, please, and uh, address Mr. Silverman, please. Mr. Silverman, my name is Joe Phillips. Uh, Hi, Joe. Hello. I'm a theist. I appreciate your position, and I appreciate your, your candor, uh, the respect that, that uh, all of us should be working toward one another, I think, is sometimes a little lacking in our conversation. However, I do have a serious question in regard to your, uh, your position. I contend that if we're going to hold this discussion concerning what is the church, whether it be church at large or church as it's defined uh, mystically, we are all constrained to an epistemology. And we are all constrained to that epistemology with an element of faith. We have to assume belief. So, that being said, we have to assume an origin. You're saying to me that, oh, excuse me, that uh, evolutionary theory, where it be punctuated Darwinian evolution or Big Bang, is in fact a fact. I would take a contention with that, sir. And the reason I would is because it excludes itself from scientific method at origin. It's not observable, reproducible, or anything of that nature in regard to origin. Now, carrying that into your position in microevolution or punctuated Darwinian evolution or whatever you hold as your ideology, you still have to carry an element of faith and belief, and therefore we are all religious, is I think the real word, okay. which would define us as churchy. Okay, so uh, you're move, using the word faith in double meaning, and you're using the word belief in double meaning. Uh, let me correct your inconsistency. Let me correct you. Uh, evolution does not explain abiogenesis. Evolution is not about the origin of life. It's not about that. It's about how life has progressed over the eons, generation to generations, through a process called natural selection where those that are most likely to pass their genes on have survived. And that is a proven fact. And when I say a proven fact, I want you to understand that the phrase proven fact has meaning. And whatever you want to equate proven fact, that level of certainty, that's how certain we are that evolution 
has and is continuing to see to act exists all the time. You mentioned the phrase microevolution versus macroevolution, I assume. This is a falsehood in and of itself. And I'm going to just take a moment to explain this to you, okay? If you, um, let's say it takes uh, 5,000 generations to move from one species to another, macroevolution, okay? Let's say it takes 5,000 generations. Now, what does that mean? That means if we took a time machine and went forward in time 5,000 generations, the people that we'd find at the other end of that time machine, the 5,000 generation people, uh, they would not be able to breed with us and have fertile offspring. That's what a species means. But if we went 2,500 generations in the future, we would find a race of species, a race of humans that can breed with the 5,000s and the todays. So where's the species? Now, if you went to the 7,500 generation, you would find people that could breed with the 5,000, but not the 2,500, even though the 2,500 and the 5,000 can breed with each other. So species is a soft term. And the terms microevolution and macroevolution are false because they imply that there's some sort of difference in what is happening. There is not. Microevolution and macroevolution are simply evolution. And it's been proven over the same period of time. It's been proven over and over again in the labs. We've got all the proof that we need. We've got dinosaur bones everywhere. We've got transitional fossils. In fact, every fossil is a transitional fossil. Everything that we need to know shows us proof positive that evolution is true. It does not speak to the origin of life. And therefore, the fact that it doesn't talk about the origin of life isn't the point. It's not, it's, it's not a flaw because it doesn't talk about that. It's a completely different process. Bio, abiogenesis is a completely different process from evolution. And I want you to understand that they're totally different things and that there's no difference between micro and macro. Okay, we have Could another question. And uh, Bob, did you want to make a quick point? We're running out sure. of time. Um, we have extremely accurate measurements of the uh, of the um, of, of our solar system and in fact we actually know when the next time is that uh, this uh, you know that we're going to have rocks passing real close to the earth uh, we know how close they're going to be we have uh, we have some very accurate measurements of uh, the motion of our solar system and we can project that also backwards based on the laws of physics that we're familiar with so that even though we can't observe it, we can know exactly the position the moon was in, say, uh, 8,000 years ago yes. based on uh, now, although it may be true that scientifically we can't observe that, we can't deny the fact that that is the backward trajectory of where it was. And when we're taking a look at, uh, you know, concepts of, you know, where it all came from, the Big Bang and, and evolution, these are known trajectories so that even if one wanted to d deny the spontaneous origin of life, I don't think that one can successfully, in my opinion, deny the fact that it points back to uh, a very, uh, very difficult point. Even the Big Bang points that the, the physical universe points back to that so that even if the big bang never occurred that's then then god created the universe as if it had you know um so um you know there's this the attempt to somehow uh, make science into something that is not true just because it is making statements about trajectories uh, you, you've got to prove that these trajectories are not themselves true uh and you know Chances are there was a day before today, there was a yesterday, there was a, probably a day before that. And, uh, you know, as you go back and back and back, this is the trajectory. And I think that evolution and uh, actually the Big Bang are, are very tenable concepts. Right. I want to move this show along a little bit more rapidly. They're not uh, tenable at all. And, and to spread that kind of misinformation in order for you to protect the so-called perfection of your mythology book is absolutely disgusting in my mind. But you to, could be to, wrong to about that. To completely eliminate and omit the fact that the moon is actually slowing down and therefore the trajectory is changing. And this is something that we all know and we can look up on any internet all by ourselves. And you can too, but you won't because then you'll have to admit you're wrong and you can't do that. That's the dishonesty that makes the church evil. 
Okay, we have a brief question. Please ask it quick. Hello, my name is Matt Land, and I'm an American atheist. Uh, my question has to deal with uh, David Silverman's definition of church, which I think most people uh, adhere to that definition, uh, with America being the most religious country in the industrialized nation, and we rank 27th in education. Uh, how can we not uh, assume that uh, the indoctrination in church and uh, uh, pushing the Old Testament and, and these types of creation stories aren't pushing, uh, setting us back in education. Just a Who quick reply, for? Dave, just a quick reply. We've got one other question. Oh, I'm sorry, he was, wanna... waiting for, he was waiting for my reply. Yeah, uh, go ahead well, and reply quickly, yeah, please. for all the data, uh, but all the data does, I mean, if you look at more data, if you look at other successful democratic nations, uh, yeah, the increase of religiosity is directly inversely proportional to the quality of life index, to lifespan. Uh, it's inversely proportional to teen pregnancies and divorce. Uh, it's inversely proportional um, to uh, college education. Uh, and as the religion and the college level uh, in the red in, in the states where there's a lot of religion uh, is much lower than the college level in the blue states where there's a lot less religion. Um, and I shouldn't have made the red blue analogy there, but I did and I shouldn't have and I recognize it. But in the less religious states, uh, you've got a better education level. In the more religious states, you've got a worse education level. Uh, that's not good. And what one of the things that I really don't like about religion is that it it um, it it teaches people to avoid critical thinking. It, it, it prohibits critical thinking. It says memorize and regurgitate and just take it for granted that this is true. And that's the kind of learning that's, well, it's actually not really learning. It's just memorization and regurgitation. And when that gets translated off into schools, in, into school behavior, um, you've got standardized tests um, that are mimicking it. And so, yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, it's not the only thing that's standing in our way, but it's a big thing that's standing in our way. Okay, we've got one other quick question. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mike, and uh, people are saying here that they are uh, atheists, and that's not true. Everyone is a theist. Everyone knows that God exists, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And my question to Dave is, if you believe that there's nothing, and we die, and we go in the ground, and that's it, what is your purpose for being here in this life? Uh, first of all, I just want to address how wonderful it is that everybody in the world agrees with you. I mean, that must make you a very special, very knowledgeable person. I mean, I can, if, if I were to say, oh, don't worry, nobody actually is stupid enough to believe that there's an invisible man in the sky. Everybody out there is really an atheist. Some people might take that really offensively, Mike, but no, I'm really glad everybody deep down agrees with you. Where do I get my meaning of life? the same way you get your meaning of life, from within. Okay, Eric and Sai, I want you to have some final comments to David before he leaves. Yeah, David, thanks uh, Thanks for joining us, man. I, I, I would love to interact more with you. Uh, I, I, I really do enjoy good discussion. I enjoy good uh, dialogue. I mean, he made several statements uh, that we claim the stories are perfect, uh, you know, that we say science is wrong, man, for one, I, I love science. I don't think science is wrong. I think that uh, Dave would agree. We're all dealing with the same facts. The question is, how are we interpreting those facts? What, what conclusions are we coming from? Um, I, I don't think that, that theists and atheists have a different set of facts. What I do think is in question is, is which worldview can account for the idea of facts, something that cannot be wrong. I mean, if something could be wrong, then it's not a fact. So, I, again, I tr that's, keep trying to go... Not true. But you could be wrong about that. Well, to say that's... <laughs> no. <laughs> so... Uh, this discussion's a waste. When you go into that, it's a wasteful, it's a wasteful experience. Well, of course you want to avoid you that, but we can let it track, Side track, up, side track, and you're not going to get to the meat. But you could be wrong about that. And that's yeah. where... And that's where, for me, the, the real important issue is, okay, if we're going to talk about facts, if we're going to talk about science, if we're going to talk about knowledge, we got to find out what is knowledge, what is truth. And that's why this discussion ends up going down the road of, how, can we have absolute truth? Can, can we obtain it? To hear Greg say no, and then to hear Bob say, 
absolutely. I mean, it's ludicrous to say you can't have you know truth. It is I, I see that it seems to me if I were trying to get to the root of the problem, that's the root of the problem. That's the foundation where things go awry is, hang on, can we have truth or can we not have truth? If we can't have truth, then it doesn't do any good to have a discussion, does it? Well, let, let me ask you a question just out of curiosity. Do you believe that the Old Testament is the Word of God? It's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay, when, when, when you say that, that sounds, you know, like saying amen to if you're in a theistic crowd, maybe in a fundamentalist church, but some of us who have actually studied the Greek, first and second temple Hebrew, and Aramaic would actually ask you the question, have you considered what an abjad is? No, I haven't. Okay, so you're saying that an abjad, which is a consonantal text, it's been actually pointed in four different categories and all diametrically oppose each other. And it depends on which pointing system as to how you translate it. It's highly ambiguous. And Dr. Foer is the one who is quoted as stating it's like looking at abstract art. Mm -hmm. And so it's all in the eyes of the beholder. It's like going to an art museum. And so if I interpret it one way and someone else does it another way, that's fine. It's simply a creative process. The Jews for years have never argued the Protestant theory of the Old Testament, nor the Catholics. They never argued the same as the Jews have, because the Jews have always treated they they have always treated their their consonantal text as a traditional model of simply allowing it to be something like abstract art. It was never considered to be an accurate text at all. Uh, if you look at the linguists who have dealt with this abjad, it has never been accurately represented in any context because it's nothing more than abstract art. And do you have any proof that you can actually render something that's simply consonantal that Wait, you can you uh, that accurately quick, represent? I just wanted to give Dave an opportunity to say goodbye. We've kept oh, him yeah. 20 minutes Before he goes, I'd like to say one thing to him. God does not send people to hell for denying what they don't know, but for sin against the God they do know. So, David, I would urge you to repent for your sin against the God you do know, and I thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, by the way, the American Atheist National Convention is later this month, uh, March 28th through 31st in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're going to have A.C. Grayling and the lead guitarist for Twisted Sister is going to be there. Uh, cool. The website is atheist.org, and please check it out because we're about to sell out. Look for our billboards in Austin and Dallas. Hey, David. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. I really appreciate it. Hey, can you give us uh, a URL also? Sure. It's atheists.org, A-T-H-E-I-S-T-S.org. I want to everything about American Atheists is there. I want to invite you back to the show. I would like to talk to you further about various things, and I certainly do appreciate you being on the show. As for the statement that Cy made about hell, I would like to ask Cy, uh, as you leave the show, can I ask him if there is a that? hell, uh, can you provide me with a syntagmatic and a paradigmatic analysis that would pr prove what you're saying is true? I, I would be happy to if I understood the, the words that you're using, but before I do that... Oh my God. It, <laughs> No, I don't know the words. Are, but, I mean, but, you're, this this is why this is why D Dave is extremely upset about theism. Oh, I don't have understand those words. I, I'm telling you, if you can explain them to me, I'll answer you know? the question. But before I do that, I would say that in your in your conversation, you talked a lot about scripture. So scripture is not your ultimate authority. Is that clear? I, when it comes to authority, well, what is your ultimate authority? Well, Maybe you can answer that. Well, without interruption, please let me answer mm -hmm. your your point. Well, okay, let, well, let me well, interrupt it just one more time to say, was there anything else specifically to Dave? Because I feel bad. Yes, I, Dave. I, I hey, this is Eric. Hey, Dave. If I can make it to the atheist convention, I would love to do an interview with you and just get a chance to meet you. I don't. Hopefully, that'll work out. But. If, well, we, Eric, I, I, I would love to shake your hand at the Atheist Convention. I'll be extremely busy the entire time because I'm running it. Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to sit down with you one-on-one uh, -on -one sometime and uh, maybe do something, maybe have a little fun together. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks, Dave. Take care, everybody. Dave, bye -bye. you've been a wonderful guest. Thank Let's you, give Dave. him a hand. Bye-bye.
Okay, now let's take it up. Uh, Bob, you're in there. Hello. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I think we need to talk about this idea of Scripture because I think that it is the basis by which people are pontificating X, Y, and Z and going into this episteme context. Am I wrong? I, I think that um, you're, uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I, I can't words... hear, Bob. Let me get some house sound for you, Bob. Okay. I need some house sound. Yeah. Okay, go for it, Bob. I, I would, um, you know, I would say that you're definitely correct. The word scripture in English today conveys many implications that simply did not exist in uh, Koine Greek or in Aramaic. Uh, the, the, the word we get it from is one that basically means writings or literature and was a reference that grew out of the fact that whenever a document was considered significant enough that more people should read it, it would end up being hand copied as the only way to make it happen and distributed. And these things were writings. And no matter whether it was a copy of a receipt or a, or a story or a poem or something that was uh, even uh, with a sacred theme, uh, this is what that word really means uh, that is translated scripture. And so as a result, when we have in our Bible this word scripture, which indicates today something that is divinely inspired, that's usually what it means, we're actually doing a bait and switch. Instead, it should be translated as literature, or it should be translated as writings, um, or documents, and things like that. And so we're actually creating we're creating a pretext for making statements that the Bible says about itself that the Bible doesn't actually really say about itself, you know, uh, when it says, uh, you know, like when it says uh, they translated all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, it says really, you know, all writing is uh, given by inspiration of God. And it's it's really a verse. It's not even talking about the Bible. It's 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 comparing the sacred uh, literature that, that uh, Timothy had been uh, raised on. And he's being encouraged to actually take a look at the fact that that, that all literature represents, on some level, something useful to uh, to help prepare a person to to anything worth doing, and uh, that that's the point of that text, and it's translated into something that uh, turns into a claim of the Bible about itself when it isn't. And linguistically, uh, the history, when we're talking about diachronics, we're talking about the way that words change in usage over time. When we do a diachronic study of these words, and we're going to be honest about the diachronic elements of these words, uh, we find that um, you know that there's a there's a problem here that the word didn't mean the way we're taking it and the kind of context we put it into. When we do a synchronic study, we're looking at the way this word was used in different ways in different regions at the same time within the same language, and. And I think that when we find linguists who are studying the language this way, something which I got to tell you, I have rarely met any fundamentalist who has any even inkling about what it is to do a genuine linguistic study of the of the biblical language. They claim to believe this is the inerrant word of God, and they don't even study what words are, how language works, how words work. And uh, I found it interesting that one comment there, the person asking David a question, David Silverman, a question, was saying that people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And it seems to me that uh, that many times this fundamentalist view in, in believing that it's perfectly okay for children to be mauled and for a God to kill all but eight people, that it strikes me that uh, if I was going to guess where the suppression of truth and unrighteousness is coming from, I have to go with this concept that tries to turn this text into something it doesn't even claim to be. Sigh. Well, let's get back to my question. What is your ultimate authority? Uh, I, I Are you really asking. No, I, I'm, I'm asking Dr. Jones. Okay. Uh, I, I can't say that I have an ultimate authority. Well, I can't. What, what is your final arbiter as to what is true in Scripture? I can answer it. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask Dr. Jones because he's making a lot of knowledge claims about Scripture. Well, I, and I'd I'm, like to know no, what no, his, what well, his just, ultimate just, standard just, just is. Just a minute. Well, one of the things that I would avoid, first of all, is the idea of calling it scripture. Uh, I That's think, fine. What is your I, I think I think that has an extreme bias. Number one, I, I would simply say I, I can't honestly say that we have enough 
and dexical and didactic elements within the read itself to say X, Y, and Z about most of it. And so when you claim that it is your authority, I would ask you to provide me with the indexicality and didactic elements that are necessary to have a meaningful understanding of it. Is it Please that provide that for me. Is it me. true that that's necessary? It's true that it's necessary okay, if you are to understand X, Y, or Z about any linguistic mindset, because without linguistic and non-linguistic elements, you can go nowhere and you can make no claim, whether it be knowledge, X, Y, or okay. Z. And so you're trying to pontificate an issue of knowledge without having knowledge of how this actually works. That makes absolutely no sense. You, and so I'm asking okay. for I'm indexicality. Totally I'm ax, right. asking for didactic elements of the text, and I'm simply all ears here. Please right. provide me with them. Well, you've made a truth claim, and you said that you have no ultimate standard. So when you say that it's true that this is required, I'd like to know what is the standard by which you call anything true. Well, see, I think you're dancing. I think you're playing a I shell game. That, but I, I think, think it's you're clear avoiding. For the people that are it. Well, if you're tr if you're trying to move these people emotionally, you're doing a wonderful no, I'm not job. To move them emotionally. I'm simply asking you questions that you can't answer. You can't. I, give I don't me. understand your question. Well, that's what I'm saying. This Can is I what try to Dave restate the questions in a different, in, in, in more layman's English? You could, but you've already said you could be wrong, but I think you claim to know. So really it, again, no, I'm, let's I'm not, only let's asking not, you these questions. Let's not play so that I, I'm that's concerned. You're not asking me? Okay, that's fine. Hands. I'm sorry. We've got to stop <laughs> with this cheap trick of, of you could be wrong. It's old, and we need to move on. You're disrespecting okay. your host. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Get off the stage. Have a good day. Why, why did he want to do that? Well, it's, the problem is it's not a cheap trick. The problem is you got somebody who's denied knowledge and now wants to make knowledge claims. You've got somebody that's asking you, what's your ultimate authority? And you're saying, I don't have one. Yeah, but we did it. Let's, let's okay, but, so, well, the problem is but, you but, can't move on from there. That, that is like a, that's a conversation stopper is what it is. So if Once, I ask for him to provide me with indexicality, Provide me with didactic elements. If you ask me to explain, can't. if you ask me to explain the Greek language or the Spanish language, I couldn't do that because I wouldn't understand it. Okay. Now I, I that in and of itself, what what he can do though is say, "Hang on, before we even get there, you're saying that explaining that makes a difference. How do you know that explaining that makes a difference?" He's asking for your ultimate authority of how do you know what actually makes a difference. You're saying it makes a difference. You're making that claim. He's saying, how do you know that claim is even valid? How do you know that claim is true? Because we haven't gotten to truth. I'm simply well, Eric, saying... I'd like an opportunity to jump in, in when in your terms, works. though. Is that an important question to you? Is it, you're saying that the, the scripture is your ultimate authority. Is it important to you, as far as your knowledge goes, that what you understand the scripture to say is actually what was initially written and you're understanding it correctly. It's, it's very important to me, extremely important. That's something that, like I said at the very beginning, I am in the search for truth. I want to know truth. The question is, How can you what know? is truth okay. without God? And if we're going to, b believe me, I get the whole, I, I know you enjoy Bart Ehrman and uh, things like that, but how um, the, the point has to stand. Um, what... Can I? Uh, what are we gonna what are we gonna believe? What is our ultimate authority? And Can I answer that? Well, the way the way Dr. Jones has answered is his ultimate authority really is himself. And I'm going No 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 well no, then no, no. I, I didn't Or you claim said I don't authority. have one. I don't, I don't have, have an one, ultimate authority. Right, exactly. Okay, well then you I'll tell you and I'm not trying to this is just from scripture, you can't be a Christian then and not have an ultimate authority. So you're saying that I'm not a Christian? I'm saying that's what this book says. I'm saying this book right here says, without Christ as your ultimate authority, without, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, uh, verse 3, unless you, um, if you don't, if you can't but, claim but, that Jesus but that, Christ but, is God, then you're but, not of but, the Holy Spirit. But what you're claiming, Eric, is this, and this is, I think, what Bob would say, uh, and I'm simply speaking for myself, but I'm simply saying you're holding up an English translation. Correct. And there are so many linguists out there. I don't know of any linguist who would agree with what you're saying. I know. Of, I, know this, of, I just not, was talking to one this weekend, Okay, l listen to me. L okay. Get him on my show, and we'll square Her. things up. <laughs> now, listen to this. When you hold up an English translation, 
no linguist today will admit that we have the didactic and indexical elements. But we haven't even, we're not even at that level yet. You're talking at a level before we establish what is truth, before we establish a lot of things that are necessary to even have that conversation. That's so why we're asking you in your terms, though. It's not important whether we understand these things as absolutely true or not. You believe that the Bible is absolutely true, and, and you are using this particular translation of the Bible. Do you not feel it's important to have an accurate understanding of what the Bible says? And would it not be significant if what you are understanding it says is actually not what it was intended to mean in the first place? Yeah, that I do want to know that. And I know there has been a whole lot of study done. That's what Dr. Jones is asking you. Right. Yeah, he, that's, that's when important. When he's talking about deictic elements, he's talking about uh, aspects of the, the nature, how the language functions, uh, and how it points to things that it refers to. I get you know, that, when he's yeah. talking about indexicality, all language gets used in a way where it says things about the context that regular users of the language uh, already understand as part of the context, but that a non-user of the language would not realize the language points to. These are things that, that anthropological um, linguists study in terms of the way that language gets used. And this is something that has not been done very thoroughly at all with Koine Greek within, within Christian environments. Most Christian environments are more concerned about making sure that they understand the original Greek in terms of the way that it sus sustains their theology and their tradition. And I think that that's not a linguistically honest way of, of looking at the text. Could, could I answer the other question, though, about ultimate authority? Go for it. Um, I believe this with, with all of my heart. Every single human being is, whether they want to be or not, whether they are in, whether they are competent or not, and they are not competent, you are responsible for your life. You are responsible for what you think. You are responsible for your conclusions. You and you alone are the ultimate authority in your life, and I am the ultimate authority in my life. That's a very precarious position to be in. It's kind of an arrogant position to be in. It is a position nobody is qualified to do well. It ought to be an extremely humbling position. But I would want to argue that every single human being decides for themselves what the meaning and significance is of everything that they run into. And it is their decision. It is their decision alone. And you must own it and recognize it for the frail thing that it is. And therefore, uh, even when you submit to some other authority, you do so because you have evaluated it as worthy of that submission. And you can't submit to it until you have decided it's worthy of that. And that there's a sense in which I think that this concept that tends to exist of a, of a um, hierarchical army-like authority with God is in some ways a very synthetic and false way of talking about the authority of Scripture, even talking about, you know, Jesus made it clear, I'm not a Lord like the other Lords are. This is not the point. This is not what the kingdom of heaven is all about. We're not here to submit to somebody who's in charge. That's not the point. We're in a relationship, and so therefore, when it comes to real authority of the sort you're looking for to determine what truth is, we're on our own, and there's no other place to go. As and is that true? As we may be. <laughs> okay, Eric, you, you, you can see how that whole statement can be undermined by— Oh, it can be. It, it, exactly, and so we're not at the foundation yet, you know? Uh, we'll never Bob, find that foundation, because the foundation— Is that is true? Conclusion. You see how all you okay, have to but, do is okay, ask, okay, is that okay. true? Now, to, well, the statement, will never find the foundation, is a foundational statement. It is. Okay, well, you said you'll never find the foundation, so right. you're contradicting yourself. No, I'm talking about how precarious it is. Let, so, okay, let, let, let me let me respond okay, real quick ahead. to the idea that I am my own authority. Do I can I make sense of how a virgin could give birth? No. Can I make sense of how a man can walk on water? Absolutely not. Can I make sense of, of how a, people can walk around a city and the walls can fall down? No. Can I make sense of how somebody can speak the world into existence? No. I don't believe those things based on my authority. I believe them based on God's authority. I don't believe them no, because that's of... that's not true. But, 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 that's not true. But, 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 Bob, but just, uh, okay, okay, now... I now believe I those things based on your authority. You believe that God has the authority to say those things, and therefore they're true. 
Now, You're just I, shifting the the focus. Well, before I go there, then now I would have to take the conversation with Bob back down to the lower level. Bob, you said the idea that we can't be sure of things, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said the idea that we can't be sure of things is ludicrous. You know lots of things. So you and and um, David Silverman and uh, and Greg would disagree on that. Is that correct? You're, you say I, we no, can know I think, things. I think it was semantical. I think it was semantical. Okay, I so hang on, I hang exist. on. Okay, so you do know things is what you're saying. I think, I not only think I know things, I think you know things. And right. in fact, I think and part of your argument is that everybody knows things. Correct. Part of your argument is that everybody knows that God exists. Correct. And now, does Greg know things? He sure does. Okay. Now, when Greg, and Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, when Greg states, I could be wrong about everything, do you, Bob, see that, that as an admission of, I don't know anything? Do you, can, you, can you see the, 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 the equation, the relationship there? Yes, and I think it's a false one. You think the relationship is false. So when he says, I could be wrong about everything, you don't I think... I think that's a typical, humble statement that we make in our country because it's thought to be arrogant to say anything else. But I think that people really do feel quite certain about a great number of things. It's just it comes across very arrogant saying so honestly. Okay, so if I asked you the question, could you be wrong about everything? You're saying no. Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely when, not. I would claim that it's impossible right. for me to be wrong about everything. So when Greg says, I could be, you're saying he can't really hold that position. He does know things to be true. You're disagreeing with him. I'm disagreeing with what he said, but I think right. that, um, you know, I think that that's just a way we talk in our, well, in our, it's now, a part of our politeness. Okay. Now as a linguist, I go, oh, wow, you, you, you're totally, you're, you're basically letting him get away with murder as a linguist, because if it was me, exactly. you'd be holding my feet to the fire. And I no. feel like you're letting him get away with a lot by what you just said. Well, saying, I, oh, it's just a let statement. Let me jump in, since we're talking about me here. It's just a phrase. <laughs> um, yes. It, Dave, before he left, somebody had asked him about evolution um, being a fact. He used the term fact uh, in the same way that I would use the term no. Um, we, for something to be a fact, we would need to know it. I think that the two are, are inextricably intertwined. And when we, we look at those two terms, he used a, a great analogy there in saying, or, or a great figure of speech, I guess, in saying that to whatever degree you believe something can be known, that is how much we know this. However confident you are in Anything is how confident we are in this. So, yes, I, I come from the, the position that even if I would declare myself 100% certain on something, I can still be wrong I, as a logical extension of that which is possible. But uh, that, that's – it's but is it probable? Is it probable? No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Now the confusion. Just so you know, what you just did is you related subjective one hundred percent certainty to objective one hundred percent certainty. You Correct. basically right, and that's where what the, I did is I made the distinction, and you don't. No, You're I, that's subjectively where subjectively one hundred percent certain that God exists and wrote the Bible. No. And therefore, you extend that into objective certainty. Now, Bob hang on, hang on. Let me address that real certainty. quick. If if you can only be one hundred percent certain subjectively, and you could be wrong about everything. That's why when, when Cy was sitting here and said, but you could be wrong, is because you can't even know that objectively. You would say there is no objective truth. There is only subjective truth. That's, that's absolutely false. There is certainly an objective truth. Could that objective that reality. On. Could that objective truth be wrong? No. No, because that, by definition, this is a tautology. Objective truth Okay. is by definition true. The question then comes, it, it, the question has never been, even if we want to talk about the subject of God, the question has never been, is there a God? The question is, is a belief in God justified? We're coming from a subjective or subjective framework. So subjective truth is the only thing that really matters in this context. Objective truth exists whether we believe in it or not. That is reality. And that's what I mean by I could be wrong. My subjective truth could be not in accordance with that which is objectively true. However, we have no objective way of knowing that because we are subjective animals. That's what we are. 
we cannot go move into an objective position from our subjective framework. And okay. that's why it is possible for me to be wrong about something, even if I'm 100% certain. Okay. And the I, same is true for you. And it's also possible things to be absolutely true, even though you as a human animal do not possess the ability to nail it down with the level of certainty that it could never, 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 ever be challenged in any manner. But, you know, most people find that uh, that as they get to a certain age, that uh, most of what they begin to learn thereafter is more of a fine tuning and a modification, not a complete radical revolution of what they've ever thought. Uh, and so, you know, when we're talking about degrees here, you know, uh, could I actually hit a grain of sand on the moon with the rocket? Probably not, but I bet you I can get within uh, three inches. Okay, we, we, uh, that's we, good enough for government work. Okay, we, and I think I don't that, like government uh, work. <laughs> and I think that you know what we're talking about in terms of um, you know because we are subjective beings, um, I, I don't think that you know even if God could reveal to you something that's absolutely true, you cannot demonstrate to me that you as a subjective person have the capacity to actually truly understand it. Nor can you show me that there's any need that you should be able to understand it at that level. And, uh, and in a sense, it, it becomes a, a form of uh, social leverage to claim that one has that. We have 20 minutes left in the show, and I've tried to give everyone enough time to speak. And I think that we have, you know, made some ground here, or covered some ground. We have uh, actually a young man. I want you to introduce yourself and ask a quickie. Uh, we only have about 18 or 16 minutes left in the show. And so uh, we have a question from our audience. Please ask. Uh, hi, my name is Michael Fulford. Um, unfortunately, I have a lot of questions that I would like to address. And unfortunately, <laughs> well, let's just take one, one tonight. I, I know, I'm trying yeah. to pick one. Um, if I remember correctly, the Bible you use is the King James Version, correct? That's, I have here the Evidence Bible, which is the comfortable King James Version. <laughs> okay. Uh, the reason why I ask is there's twofold. Uh, being myself, I enjoy history, I enjoy myths. Uh, I am aware that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, despite claims to the contrary, actually do not perfectly match the Old Testament. There are various uh, mistranslations, errors made. Uh, King James himself, when he ordered the translation made, he had it done in a poetic style instead of a direct translation, which means there were errors that were intentional as well as accidental. Could, uh, the translation of Lucifer in uh, the beginning of the Bible is one such example. And from that, we have the whole concept of Lucifer today. Uh, so my question would be, if you, uh, like Dr. Jones was going into with the information of the translations of the Bible, as well as going into all the books that were left out as the Catholic Church compiled the Bible, uh, how can you really say that that's a very definite tone? Yeah, I would, my answer would go back to the very, very foundation that I keep talking about, because without God's word, without revelation from God, we can't know anything. So okay, you but believe it because you need it to. Why be do true. you need to know anything? With it that kind it of is. Yeah. But but let me ask you something specific as to that Bible, the King James Version. Uh, the reason that I have a lot of problems with that particular version, in particular, it's because deponent theory is all over the place in that Bible. In other words, there is not consistency with how they treated deponacy. And so I can name at least 100 things that they were not consistent in when translating Greek and when dealing with the Hebrew. Uh, I, I find that it's one of the poorest translations in the world. And so why would you advocate that something so synthetic? Because back in that day and time, they were using something called Holy Ghost Greek and a Holy Ghost understanding of the language itself. Even uh, Bible Belt scholars like Dr. Harris out of Dallas Theological Seminary, he has said that we have had such a dramatic change in our understanding of Greek in the last 100 years, it would be, uh, it would be foolish to use anything older than maybe 90 to 100 years. We'd, we'd be better off using those kinds of works as doorstops. And so my question is, with the reconstruction models that you have on the market today and with all the reconstruction that you have, both with the languages and with the text, why would you not move on to something that's maybe a little bit more accurate with what the Bible 
is about or these various manuscripts. So you're making a claim that it's inaccurate and that it has problems. But earlier, when the question was posed to you, what's your authority? You said you don't have one. No, There's a contradiction one. there. To, to, say, to say, hey, I'm going to make I'm, an absolute claim that this is inaccurate see, what you're doing, and then say I don't have an authority what, 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 what means it's all subjective to but you. But what, what, what you're returning to is, is you're, you're trying to return to an argument to try to make a point there. I'm simply right. asking you, why would you accept a book that has so many uh, deponent uh, complexities that have been translated in various ways that contradict you to each other. I don't understand that. Okay. And so th this is why I have problems, and maybe you can help me to be honest and maybe be the kind of Christian that you want me to be. But I have serious problems because when you don't have didactic and indexicality, those particular elements, we have less than 30% of them. And that's tr a true statement. And if we have 30%, we would be lucky. And I'm simply saying, how can we claim that that's an authority when we lack the linguistic Eric? and non-linguistic elements that are essential to even understanding the complexity of the okay. text? Let, 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 me, let, let me address, your, your question, let me address that Jones, real quick. Uh, Jones, let, he just asked me a question. Into something that, um, that, that might be a little bit easier to relate. Yeah. Um, linguists, for example, have done things like this. They'll go, to, uh, they'll go to China or they'll go to Laos, and they'll take people there who don't know the language, and they'll take people there who do know the language, and they will see if, uh, you know, how people will understand the language as used. And they will take people who learn the language as a secondary language, and then they study the sorts of mistakes that people who don't normally use the language um, uh, will make. And they've learned to categorize the, the various different kinds of cognitive assumptions that all human beings tend to make. And we have noted as linguists the various sorts of misuse of language that people who don't use a language natively will make without even realizing it. And we've been able to categorize this. And what we have discovered is that the clarity and the meaning in every single language in the world, that most of that clarity comes from didactic and indexical meaning that is something that a non-native speaker is it finds extremely difficult to get into the, the the essence of and what this means that if we're talking about a dead language the amount of uh, reconstructive work that we need to do and by the way the, the linguists have also then tried to find are there ways that a person who doesn't speak the language natively can come to a clearer understanding and yes there are various methods that that linguists can use to get <laughs> much, much closer. Now, these are observed methods. It's not as if these people are making these kinds of observations and these, these understanding of the way that language works anthropologically so without any kind of authority. Just like if you go to a court of law and you are a juror and somebody comes in who's an atheist and says, yeah, I was there, I was in the store, I saw him shoot the guy. Uh, are you going to say that, well, you know, he could be wrong, he doesn't know anything, so I don't think anybody killed anybody. There comes a point in time when it gets absurd and ridiculous, when you have to recognize that scholarly efforts have found things that at least appear so well to be true that their persistence is, is foolish to deny. Now, we have learned a great deal about language, and so the, the argument that Dr. Jones is making is that we know that the way language works through usage is not the sort of thing that can be easily understood or assumed without using sp specific types of techniques of re-examining the language in its context and as its usage, and that this has not been done not only with the King James, but with, with most translations. And so he's arguing that from what we actually know about linguist, uh, linguistics, how is it possible people even really trust the textus recepticus or or the king james uh, it's 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 just not well justified okay uh, go for it eric it, hey i want to tell you something i love you a lot and i respect you a lot and i'm so thankful that you have come our way tonight i want you to come back but i want you to tell me what you think to be true about this discussion what we're talking about right here about the text itself okay 
here's here's where I would go. Let me make sure I understand you properly because I don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay. Are you saying that using this or any other translation, we can't know how God made the world, that sin came into the world, that death came because of sin, that Jesus came and paid the penalty of death, and that, it, and that uh, repenting and trusting in him uh, as our personal Savior is, is the way to uh, eternal life with him. Are you saying that because we don't have the didactic and the, the other word you use, because we don't have that, we can't know that for sure? I, I'm simply saying that the church has given us a gloss system that is extremely spurious. It was borrowed out of something and interpolated into something. And all of the systems that we have are extremely synthetic models of translation theory only. And it's given us a synthetic theology. Exactly. So, I, so would, I would say that, uh, that the way that Eric just reviewed this, the summary of his theology is something that I would say, yes, absolutely, that is something you can't know from the text, from the way that it's traditionally translated, uh, that that is a synthetic result of the way the text has been shoehorned into a concept that is a westernized distortion of a Hebrew text uh, that took place over the time the, the Latin Vulgate was dominant and the uh, and, and Augustine was really uh, reigning as king within the Catholic tradition, that this is all very synthetic. And I'm saying that I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that the, the, the way that the gospel gets reduced by, by, the, by the fundamentalist story, the evangelical story, is an absolutely false claim, false, false teaching. Okay, so what, what is the gospel then? Let, let me ask that. What is the gospel? Oh, first of all, before I answer that question, is it wrong of me to be so honest about the text? No, I like I said, I'm appreciating this discussion. Okay, I, I want, I want, I want. Uh, I'm just going. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand the conclusions that are going to be drawn from what's being asked. Okay. So that's why if, I have to get right back to. If you're asking me what the gospel is, the good news is Jesus is one who came to make it known that He loves us. And is he, he God? Is I'm he sorry, God? I'm interrupting oh, you. Oh, I'm you don't. I don't mind you interrupting me. My God, I'll hug your neck in a minute. I love you very much. I'm simply saying I think that Jesus is God, but that's my opinion. I would draw that conclusion based upon an argument that I will make later, because I think that Jesus was very God, and I think that He lives in me. I think that He lives in you, but I would also state that Jesus taught us how to love not just our neighbors but also our enemies and I think that when he spoke to the Apostle Paul it became amazing and I think it contradicts the Old Testament he said that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs and so when we present Jesus dying on the cross he's atoning that is in the Protestant mindset and in the synthetic reads that you have in your lap you have a Jesus who is actually atoning for the sins of the world. That is, if you believe it. But if love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, how can you or why would you need to die and atone for something if love doesn't ever keep a record of wrongs? That is, if, in fact, God is love. And so the question would be, we've got a lot of confusion based upon synthetic models and the good news to me would be that God loves me unconditionally, accepts me unconditionally, and loves you the same. And I would say, based on what I'm going to call the authority of Scripture, rather than call it a synthetic model, based on the authority based, of Scripture... Uh, based upon the King James Version. Well, no, I mean, you, you'd get well, this out of any version. Out of any version, you're going to get, unless you repent and trust in Christ, uh, you're... you're there's going to be, uh, you are choosing to reject God. See, when I read the Greek text, I don't get any of that. I know a lot of people that read the Greek text that get exactly that. So I, I mean, if never, I had somebody I've sitting right here. I've never met anyone who has ever been fluent in Greek. I will do a show with someone who is influent in Greek, and we will do nothing but Greek. Bring them on my show. I will challenge that. That is a we'll spurious mind, mindset of theology. I've debated uh, rabbis in Hebrew because I speak first uh, and second temple Hebrew and Aramaic and also Koine and Attic Greek, I'd be more than willing to meet with him. But I'm up for the challenge. I, I, I understand that. For Let's me, go for it. I know, for me... Primary uh, information is much better than secondary information. Would so, you agree? 
primary information is better than secondary. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I, we've got a question from one of the okay. persons that I think uh, really applauds you. And so uh, would you please ask the question? That's wonderful. Yes. Um, actually, the question is for you, Dr. Jones. Okay, me. Um, my name is Mary Jo LeBlanc. Yeah. yeah. And um, my, I'm going to give a, just an example here. If I go into a fabric store and I'm wanting to purchase material to make a dress and I ask the lady behind the counter to cut me five yards of fabric, but she says, I'm sorry, we don't use a yardstick anymore. We've done away with that, it's, it's outdated. And she proceeds to cut me a piece of cloth. I go home, proceed to cut out my dress. It calls for 18 inches here, six inches there, but that's outdated, we're not using that anymore. I'm gonna come up with a mess. And so my question is, there are as many um, beliefs as there are pieces of fabric. I agree but there's you. only one yardstick of truth. By what do we measure that? That's my question for you. Well, I, I think that when you say that there is only one measuring stick for truth, I, I don't know where you're getting that idea, uh, to be honest with you. When you say that there is only one measurement for truth. Uh, I, I used to be like you. I used to think that I could pick up my Bible and I could bank on it day in and day out. And one day I became extremely honest when I was reading the Greek and the Hebrew text. And I found, wow, this doesn't square up with my English Bible. And I found that it's extremely difficult to get past the politics of religion. Because religion markets these Bibles. And this has become a bestseller because it's, it's, it's like you're appealing to the emotions of people who are desperate. And this is why... Christians today really, I, 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 I feel so sorry for them because they will argue, oh yes, it was just for God to send two she-bears to maul 42 children to death. That sickens me. And then they will also say, yes, it was just for God to make the man pay 50 shekels to the, to the rape victim's father and, and the rapist marries this victim and this victim has to live with the one who abused her, and that makes me ill inside. Amen. And I feel sorry for women who were bought throughout the Old Testament. Men would work five and six and seven years and pay for their women like chattel. And I don't think it's good or ethical to say, I love a book, this is my standard. It puts women down, it treats them just like chattel. I don't find that to be good at all. And I think we need to rise above that and get honest with the text and get honest about what is good and moral and sane. And yes, I agree with Bob. At some point, we have to take responsibility for thinking for ourselves because I'm not going to allow the ancients to dictate my life. I'm not going to live according to those abused people and the abusers of the past. I'm going to move forward with people who know how to be kind. And this is why Jesus came along. I think the good news is he came along to change the paradigm, if you will. When he said, hey, you've heard it stated out of the book that we call the mosaic idea, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you something quite differently. Don't resist an evildoer. You've heard it stated. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you something differently. Love your enemy. So he contested the mosaic law. This is why the writer of the book of Hebrews states clearly. He said that, that Jesus didn't come after the order of, of Aaron, but came after the order of Melchizedek. It would have been illegal for him to cross the line and actually fulfill the mosaic. And this is why you find Jesus healing people on Sabbath day and saying, get up your, uh, take up your bedroll and start walking because he was willing to challenge that entire theological system. And so Jesus is one who was freeing people, not subjugating people with theology. Does that make sense to your question? Mm. I know we got to end. I know that he's saying the time's You know, out. it's wonderful <laughs> to have you. I want to say, I wish uh, just Cy was still up in here. defense of Sai, it's, it's uh, you know, what, when Joey said, hey, don't say that again. Don't say you could be wrong. Uh, in, a, in a sense, you got to understand, for us, that's like saying, 
Put down your gun. Stop using that. You know. No, I and think so what he I was just doing. He, 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 he just was irritating people with the same old, same old. And that's why Jesus, and that's why Joey came in and said, "Hey, you know, if you're going to do that, and you're just going to run people in the mud. That doesn't make sense." And so let's concentrate on what you have to say. I'd love to have Sai. Do you want to sit back? Okay. <laughs> I'm told to sit back. Joey <laughs> runs this place, and he does a good job, and he may make a mistake or two. And well, if I'm we happy. love him, we'll get past that. I'm Go happy for it. about something. I know we got to close, but uh, yeah. uh, Bob and Greg, thanks for being on the, on the show. Pleasure to interact with you guys again. I'm glad I made you guys disagree on something, or at least I think I did. You guys will probably figure out a way that it was actually not a disagreement. Do you believe I'm a Christian? I have. God knows that. I don't know that. You don't know that I'm a Christian. I mean, do you know that I am? Oh, yeah, I believe that you love God. Christ is in you. I stated that earlier. Yeah. Do you believe that Christ is in me? Do I believe that you love other people? And no, the Bible I'm says... asking you, do you believe that Christ <laughs> is in me? Get specific. Um, Let's quit man. playing games here. I don't know that I can tell. I mean, do I believe that you have the love of Christ? Do I see love in you? Yes. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for but another. Do you think that Christ is in me? I mean, I love Jesus with all of my heart. I know. But I'm not willing to commit to worshiping this book. This is not my sacred cow. I can walk past this. I see most of this as something that's evil, hmm. not good. That's why I can't claim Obviously, that this is I've my I've got authority. a real hard time with that. I know you, know you that. do. Yeah, I you know was, when I was your age, actually younger, I believed like you did. But it was in 1982 my paradigm shifted. And I had to finally admit, when God creates mankind and he sends his first son out into the backyard to play with the, the worst and the most maniacal snake, the most See, deadliest of snakes, what but, kind of father but we're do looking you send at your totally kids out in the backyard to... To play with the snakes that deadly? Would you see, do that? Is I don't that look at this and see good? that that's what God did. I don't look at this oh, and see that on. that's what God did at all. But we'll you know, have to save I'm that for another show. I'm simply trying to nuance a point here. Who I know, tells I, I don't their think created that, I think children you're, you're taking go out an and kill infants? Who does that? Who orders infanticide, genocide, and slavery? Every Who single does time. That? Well, first of all, this, and now we're How getting that into the linguistics. It, the slavery is different than what it is today. It was different back then. In a different society, different It says culture. if you beat a, your slave, if they can get up after two or three days, you've done nothing wrong. That is slavery in the worst degree. Why can't we say that that's evil? Why can't you, as one who loves Jesus and loves me even, why can't you say that that's wrong? Can I why, say that why, that happened? I mean... That Again, doesn't we're, make we're, sense we're, to me. We're getting into something that's going to have to be for another show. It may be. Would, Eric, would you come I back? I would love to have you back at, at some point yeah. soon. I, I have not said much at all for the last probably 25 minutes, and and I just want to make one final point or a couple questions. So I apologize, Dr. Jones, for, for cutting this off, but um, the, the, the question that I have for you is we have – had several moments today where you and specifically Cy uh, were saying you you don't know that or do you know that you could be wrong, different iterations of that, um, and, and I think that that is certainly a, a powerful rhetorical tool. Uh, as you're right, when we ask you to stop doing that, that's like asking you to put down your gun. But my question for you is, when you go to the doctor, are you concerned about where they got their knowledge? If that's if that's related to the authority of Jesus Christ and and God, and are you asking them or, or saying to them? But you could be wrong. If they say you have a staph infection and you need to take this tetracycline or other antibiotic, are you going? Well, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Because yeah. otherwise, I'm not taking it. You could be wrong. <laughs> no, Greg. I think you're missing the point of what we're saying. We're saying, according to your worldview, you could be wrong. I, I'm, I'm, I guess, in a way, like Bob was saying. Well, the, the same would be true of the doctor, though. If the, the doctor, according to that person's worldview, if the doctor is not a believer in Jesus, could be saying, yeah, I could be wrong. And would that stop you from them taking that antibiotic? See, but Greg, okay, let me put it this way. You're the one saying you could be wrong. I'm not saying you could be wrong. I do believe you do know things. I do believe you can be sure of things. I think you have lots of knowledge. I think you know that we're talking right now. I think you know that you've taken biology. Uh, I think doctors know things. So I'm not saying to a doctor, you could be wrong and you may not know anything. We're using I'm saying, very different I understandings believe... of the word no. Again, from a subjective Again. sense, I know things. Objectively, it not, or my knowledge isn't even relevant. 
I, the objective truth exists regardless of what I think of it. What I think of it is in some cases in line with it. And I'm sure there are cases when it's not. And there may not be a way for me to know which is true. But I know in a subjective sense that I went to school for biology. I know that because I experienced it. But subjectively... I, I know I'm having this... But right, in a subjective sense, I know these things. So subjectively, um, you could be wrong about that. Right. It could have been a dream. See, that, that's, where, that's where I think Bob would I'm say, living in a subjective that's ludicrous. Course. That doesn't even make sense. So anyway, it, okay. I know we got our show is <laughs> we're running over time right now. I'd like Eric, to thank all of you guys. Bob, yeah. would you like to make a final comment? Make a quick yeah, one. Yeah, Eric, I I really admire your um, your, your passion, and I'm glad that uh, we had a chance to see you again. And um, you know, th this is a uh, this is a really uh, open uh, environment, and and so I, I'm really happy that, that you came along. And, uh, and unless you unless you tell somebody they could be wrong, <laughs> well, <laughs> you never know. Um, but uh, but I but being the agnostic theist, I, I have my I have one foot in one world and another foot in the other, and it puts me in an odd little place. But uh, but anyhow, I I really appreciate your coming on, and I I enjoy getting to know you even a little bit better. I hope there's some day when we get to meet each other face to face. And uh, I, I really do uh, appreciate your coming on um, and, and talking with us again. I hope you do it again. I look forward to it. Would you come back and do a show with us or a show with me, rather, just talking about the Bible? Man, the reason I hesitate specifically on that You're going to hesitate? Well, you're, you're going to be talking about things that I haven't studied. And so it'd be kind of, I mean, if it was, I will talk crea about if it was creation, only. evolution, if it was things like that, that I, I'm, that I feel in, like I'm comfortable with, I, mean, I would have a problem. I could stay in English. That'd be fine. <laughs> Eric, I mean, I, and not, not to be uh, condescending here, but you, you haven't studied evolution either. You've studied the, the creationist understanding of evolution. Uh, when have you ever I, I, taken I think a secular that, study? I think that's a low blow. Just so you know, just saying. I mean, that's like <laughs> have, have it's like telling somebody, "Come on now." Evolution in a secular college. Have, have have I taken evolution courses in a secular college? Yes. No, I have not. Okay. So is that your proof that, that I have no clue what evolution is? Because I mean, no, no. Anybody you said would... if it was something you'd studied, and I just was making the point that you've studied it only from your your worldview. I've studied both. Well, yeah, I, 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 you're, I you're claiming you're trying to say, hey, I mean, if you ask me, have I ever read any books on evolution from the evolutionary perspective? Yes, I have. So, again, I, I just I felt like that was a low blow. I, I, I think I, this, I apologize. It might my, have been my, a little bit. My, my so point, I apologize. Let, let me make a bragging point about Eric. Uh, one of the things that I do appreciate about you, you have been raised by your father, and I respect your father much. I don't agree with his position, but I respect him. And the way that you were raised, you've been exposed to possibly more than more people your age. And you certainly have lots of knowledge, both in evolution and in theology. And I appreciate that, and I respect that. Thanks. And so, I'm nowhere, nowhere close to where I want to be, that's for sure. I, you know, it's, <laughs> a uh, long ways to go. I, I'm a preacher's kid, and I, I understand the environment that one lives in. You're around academics all the time. You're around all kinds of people. And, and so when people try to spin an issue of college, uh, don't let that offend you because you, you've, you've moved on. You've, you're doing wonderful. And I would like to invite you back to uh, my show. I would like to have a meaningful conversation. I would like to have Cy here, too. Uh, I don't mind being roughed up. Nah, <laughs> I don't mind it at all. I don't need it. Like I was telling Dave Silverman, I was serious. <laughs> And, and I've told people this before. I think I'd rather go to his reason rally and talk to atheists than go to churches. I, I like thoroughly that. enjoyed yeah. Yeah. the discussions and the conversations I had with with uh, with atheists. It was it was fun. It was engaging. It was uh, I, I I'll, I'll be honest and say I was a little bit uh, disappointed in the um, what do you call it the intellectual level. Well, I think I think uh, I heard. Uh, Greg saying it on one of his shows. You you get frustrated with some of the atheists that are out there. It's like ah, some of these guys out there are idiots. And I go, yeah, they really are. So I'm I'm uh, I I felt that there at the reason rally. So yeah, but I, I enjoyed it. So are you going to commit time. to coming back and doing a show with me? Well, I think it depends on what it's on. Well, the, let's so we'll talk, talk about, about the Bible, whether it's actually reliable or not. 
think uh or let's just talk about the I tell you what let me let me invite a guest on with me uh you can have uh, any guest that you want you can have a team and (laughs) i will be by myself okay (laughs) i i I, that's fine with me right i'm just inviting you back to that kind of venue because i don't want to set anybody up i i I love to learn from people i've learned a lot from you tonight just listening I, i like the way that you present yourself you were not trying too. to bully yes. yourself. You were not trying to do any of that. And that's the thing that we try to resist. We don't want people just to bully people and make them feel uncomfortable. And I think that's why Joey uh, made the decision that he that he made. He doesn't want people to feel uncomfortable. If I can make you feel comfortable here, uh, we can make some progress because we have atheists and theists sitting in this audience. And, and they haven't hit each other yet. It is. They can actually <laughs> no. have a conversation yeah. and actually go home and feel good about having meaningful conversation. We don't have to all agree, but we need to at least come together, look at the same evidence, and start learning how to reason together. Come let us reason together. That's out of, yep. uh, for me, the absolute word again. So you're coming back? <laughs> I said, we'll, uh, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your but time. But I do look forward Eric, to talking Eric, to you guys. And more. for the record, I'd Thank love you. to have you back yes. on my show at some point as well. Appreciate you. And I, I so don't much. have the same uh, linguistic base that Dr. Jones does to, uh, to bully you about the Bible <laughs> the way he wants to. I, I'd just love to talk more about your knowledge argument. Um, it's, and, uh, and pin you down to exactly why I think that you're making an incredibly unjustified circular argument. There. But all I'm going to tell you is you could be wrong. You know that. <laughs> that's true. That's, I mean, they, we, we just did the entire show just now in that, that 12 seconds. <laughs> that's right. Now we're going to close yeah. by me saying thank you to our uh, audience here in the studio. You guys have been so patient with us. You've done an amazing job. So applaud yourself. And I hope you come back. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty. Uh, as you can tell, I, I, I would love to hear compelling arguments from both sides of the coin. I want to continue to hear that. I need that. I need you, Eric. The question is the authority, though, thing. That's, but, to me, I, that's where the but, argument's going to go but every make time. make the argument right, where right. I can actually believe something. I can't trust something if someone just says, believe it, you know. No, I, I can't I, do I that. It, I, I'm willing to allow... That's what it's going to come... It's ultimately going to come down to what's our ultimate authority. Yeah. That's really you what it's going to come on come my show to. and speak for an hour without me saying a word. I'll listen. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dance. And your host, Rhonda Jones and featuring the man who unchurched them all Dr. Michael W. Jones <laughs>